everyone, and welcome to Onyx Path Con 2023 Sunday thing and stuff. Uh, it's 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 been a lot of fun, but trying to keep track of everything in a different time zone has been a little challenging for me. So I'm just gonna say it's Sunday. Hooray! Um, uh, today we're going to play. Uh, they came from Classify, which is uh, a game that's still available for pre-order on BackerKit. So if you want to check this out and you like it, uh, please go ahead and go to BackerKit and uh, pick up. A pre-order copy of it uh and um so because uh, this first time i've run they came from classified it's when they came from games but i'm not familiar with this specific version of the game so we're gonna play a little fast and loose um because i think that especially for streams we're gonna shoot more for having a good time rather than absolute fidelity to the rules so i uh, understand that i may make some rules calls that aren't necessarily strictly by the book but you'll you'll get the idea you'll figure it out uh, so let's kind of do uh, uh, out of character introductions real quick. Um, uh, I'm, as I mentioned, my name is uh, Eddie. My pronouns are he, him, uh, and I am the executive producer here at Onyx Path. And I actually did, did I write on Classified? I don't think I wrote Yes, I did write on Classified. Yes, I wrote some of the story. I've written a lot of stuff and blurred together. Um, but I did do some of the uh, story guide uh, support for Classified. Um, so let's make our way around. I'll start with uh, Tom because he's muted. Thank you. Hi, <laughs> I'm Tom. Uh, I am a professional GM on StartPlaying.Games, and also I I do occasionally run games on the Onyx Path Twitch stream. So, uh, CJ? Hi, everyone. My name's CJ. Uh, they, them. I'm going to be playing Nora, who's she, her. Uh, I'm a performer, writer, super excited to be here. And, and Edwin? Hi, uh, Ed Wessels, he, him. I'll be playing Gabriel Reyes. Uh, you'll see how and what. Uh, I don't do anything fancy with writing, anything like that. I'm more a player than anything else. We need players to have to do the games too, so that's important. True, true. <laughs> Tom, Tom knows me all too well as a player, so. <laughs> and finally, Ryan. Uh, yeah, I'm Ryan. Um, my pronouns are any, any, but they, them is just the most consistent. Uh, I am a freelance writer for Onyx Path. I did not have the joy of writing for They Came From Classified, and I'm a forever GM, so I'm going to enjoy playing a new system and also playing a system. Um, and I'm also a, a mod, so behave. <laughs> Very much. Um, uh, since this is uh, a story path game, I suspect most of people watching are going to be familiar with it, but just on the high level to make it... Uh, uh, Make sure we're all on the same page. Um, this is a dice pool system using D10s. Uh, the objective is you want to uh, roll eights or higher's. Um, if you roll ten, that counts as two. Um, I'm probably going to use uh, hits as terminology just because I like that from Story Path Ultra. Um, so uh, you want to get a number of hits together uh, to beat a difficulty. Uh, if you have additional hits beyond difficulty, you could spend those for uh, additional uh, benefits. Um, sometimes you have complications, which are wrinkles in the challenge that uh, don't stop you from succeeding, but may make things a little more difficult. Uh, and sometimes you have access to enhancements, uh, which add additional hits if you succeed on the base dice roll. Uh, you, compi you compile your dice pools by using a combination of a skill and an attribute. Uh, there's a number of dots on your sheet, so you add those dots together. It tells you how many dice to roll to figure out how many hits you generate. All characters are made up of three paths. The archetype, which is your kind of rough role in this movie or television show. Uh, your origin, which is what your character did before they became a spy. And your cover, which is uh, the thing that your character is doing uh, when they're not being a spy. Uh, you, uh, because this is meant to be an a emulation of kind of schlocky 60s uh, spy fi television movies, um, they're going to be... Uh, Leaning into the, the the tropes, literally, of these these characters. So these characters have access to tropes, which give them benefits if they play into uh, the the kind of hackneyed conceits of these games. Um, these characters will have trademarks, which are their specialties, allow them to do extra dice at certain moments. Uh, and most importantly, all, every character has a few quips, which are taglines or key phrases they want to try to work organically or maybe not so organically into the conversation and if they do that gives them access to additional dice as well so i think that's oh one more thing um uh you have access to a, a shared pool called rewrites 
Um, I'm going to give you all three to start with. Uh, rewrites are used literally to kind of help uh, rewrite the scenario. Um, you can spend them to give additional dice on your rolls, but that is the most boring option. Uh, more commonly, you use them to pay for cinematics, uh, which are things that actually allow you to change on a meta level uh, what's going on with the uh, scenario playing through. Uh, another reason why I like to play as fast and loose because cinematics usually means that anything I try to plan is just not going to go anywhere. So it's kind of roll with it and see what happens. Um, but cinematics are things like not just a pen where anything gets retroactively turned into a gadget. Um, quick change where you suddenly change clothing uh, in a blink of an eye. Um, uh, reports of my demise where uh, your character is alleged to be to have died, but, but only come back scenes later. So on and so forth. Again, fun spy stuff. Uh, to kind of really sell this setting. Uh, does anybody on the on the uh, stream have any questions about any of that? All pretty straightforward. Okay. Then let us begin. Um, uh, this is an episode of a TV show known as The Team from Under. Uh, Under stands for the United Nations Department of Espionage and Reconnaissance. Uh, this episode title is Operation Shattered Glass. Uh, and we start with the team together in a nondescript Western European office setting in the year 1960, whatever. Uh, and uh, you're all sitting around a desk as a, a teletype comes in. Uh, so we're going to have the camera zoom around to each person as they introduce their agents and what role they have on the team. Uh, so we'll go in reverse order. We will start with Ryan. No, mommy fumbling for my unmute button. Uh, yes. Yeah, so... Um... The rest of the team would call me Max, but my name, my full name is Maximilian Stark. Um, pronouns are he, him. Uh, I am very much the uh, um, street kid gone good. Uh, I looked, I looked into a scholarship from a fraternity who are currently paying my way through college, which is my cover. Um, and I'm definitely, I do everything I can to prove to myself that I deserve to be here, um, which can come off as reckless uh, or um, endearing, depending on how you feel about such things, uh, but definitely more um, in the, the, the foolhardy Russian press all of the things and just hope to hit the right button kind of approach to Spycraft. Awesome. Uh, Edwin? Yep, I'll be uh, playing Gabriel Reyes. Uh, Gabe or Gabriel for friends, Mr. Reyes for anyone else. <laughs> um, he is basically literally born for this. This is everything he always wanted ever since reading about it, seeing the comics. It's everything for him. He parents basically pay for everything for him, and he sees it as his ultimate goal. And we'll see where it goes. And he'll be basically uh, trying to do everything right at the right moment. Awesome, CJ. Nora is, by all functionality, the second in command, uh, which means that she never gets to do any of the fun stuff and always has to wrangle the team. Uh, she is a she grew up uh, with military parents, uh, became a, a forensic psychologist early on, and was drafted into under from there. So uh, organizational psychology, kind of her thing. People, not so much. <laughs> Fair enough. And Tom. Yeah, I am playing Alistair McGuffin, and I am the R&D specialist on the team. Uh, I am supposed to create all this fancy gadget that will get, at, uh, get us out of problems. Um, I'm not saying that my gadgets are usually the source of our problems. One day, one day, I will create the mega device that will change Spycraft. <laughs> so quartermaster, maybe mad scientist. We'll see how it goes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm fueled by red tea. <laughs> Excellent. As a quick side note, I absolutely love because we're both quartermasters, but we've gone for it's such a versatile archetype. We've gone for completely opposite. We've got sciency, and I'm like, I manage people, and it's really cool. Yes. Yeah, it really shows that um, the, they did a good job on uh, figuring out the right archetypes for classified and making them interesting and compelling. Uh, so the camera goes around, you get little nameplates at the bottom for each person's name and their role on the team. 
Um, and uh, then the camera zooms out and uh, finally gets on the star of the show, uh, who's John Barnes, agent of under. Uh, this is the, the top secret agent that your team supports. Uh, and uh, generally how these episodes work is that you meet together at the beginning and then he goes off and starts the mission. Occasionally, each of you will get like one scene in the episode uh, where you can show off your special ability. But really, it, it's kind of a John Barnes show. Uh, and, uh, he steps in and, uh, he, uh, throws down, uh, a carrier pigeon onto the table, uh, uh, and it blanks because it's, it's obviously a robotic carrier pigeon. And he goes, I've just got a mission from under, uh, and he kind of shoves it, uh, at, uh, Alistair and it's like, MacGuffin, I need you to translate, decode it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he sure. hands you a piece of paper um, that's still attached to the, the robotic parrier pigeon. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and so I... you start, you start to, to, to dig through it. Um, it's a code you're familiar with. Um, and so uh, you realize that uh, you can actually plug it into um, the Dakota Tron, which is right behind you. It's a giant slot in the wall. Um, and you hear it. It's <laughs> And uh, big tape wheels spin on the wall, and then eventually a ticker tape comes out, which you can turn on and hand back to Barnes. Uh, and so he looks it over and starts looking at the ticker tape. And then Skick frowns and stares at it. And he throws it on a table and goes, bugger this, grabs his hat, and walks out. I catch myself halfway through following him because he's the example I'm, I'm trying to emulate. Uh, mm -hmm. Should we follow? Uh, if the big man's gone, then... But the paper's still there. Could mean we can shine for a change. Brief look of panic. In the distance, <laughs> you hear a car engine and a car peels out. No, he's, yeah. he's, he's really gone. <laughs> Nora's just like... No, that's on us. He's gone. Gable gra uh, grab the uh, translation, quickly glances at it. All right. And you look at it. Um, and at that point in time, uh, the title sequence comes on for the TV show. Uh, and it starts playing through. And uh, uh, hastily, um, the actor for John Barnes is kind of X'd out. So they kind of quickly skip past that on the intro. Uh, but you show each of your characters who are now moved from guest starring to starring. Uh, and <laughs> Uh, and then uh, like, yeah, you see a title card Operation Shattered Glass and we come back to you and you just finished uh, translating the ticker tape into uh, onto notepad into an actual message and the message reads during your last during the last month we discovered several individuals working in positions of power have been replaced by what can only be described as sophisticated robotic duplicates under is still trying to assess the degree and gravity of this infiltration, but a threat it poses to national security cannot be understated. Clues obtained from fragments of communications and analysis of the duplicates' activities point to a single culprit, Nestore Patrasso, billionaire and owner of Arite Enterprises. In recent years, Patrasso retired from public life, content to manage his company from his residence in Isla Farawaga, a volcanic island near Costa Rica. Access to Isla Fraga has been restricted to him, his employees, and a few selected guests. But 10 days ago, Petrazzo announced his intentions to hold a grand exclusive festival there. Prominent individuals from all over the world have been invited. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to travel to Isla Fraga, develop the truth about N Nestore Petrazzo, disrupt his plans, and neutralize any threat. Your secondary objective is to gather as much intel as possible about the robot technology. The world is counting on you. Good luck, Barnes. So, let me get this straight. He skipped going to a party? Apparently. Apparently, he was given the option to uh, choose not to accept it. It seems like a mistake when you think about it. With robot duplicates, do you know how long we've been trying to develop these? I bet you robotic pigeon twitches on, on the table. <laughs> <laughs> now, I bet you'd like to get your hands on a robot duplicate. I sure do, yes. So we're accepting this, right? Where's the big button to smash accept? I uh as as they're like leaning towards I accept, I've just like thinking almost like 
trying to whisper, Bug bugger this, I'm out under my breath to get the right intonation just to copy Barnes. <laughs> and then I like I, I realize what I'm doing and yes, we should accept this. It will look good. <laughs> it'll definitely uh, it look good on your resume. Uh, yes, the camera now pans over where you didn't see it previously, but now there's a big red button that says accept on it. Oh, definitely hitting that one. Yeah, and it makes the pigeon explode. Yes, it does. But it's kind of like a, a second. <laughs> It's not really a big explosion, more kind of like a sad little like, and like smoke comes up. One of those where the camera pans rapidly away because they can't destroy the model, so it's just got to... <laughs> <laughs> Cut back to it with on fire. <laughs> Government money, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's get everything ready, and uh, I guess you're going to need... Let's see, it's just sort of like sorting through papers. Well, you're going to need a disguise, or at least a nice suit. Mm. Uh... It's not Barnes, so at least we don't have to worry about being recognized. Uh, starts sliding over some different, like, um, pay pages and things like that. All right, and um, make sure you bring your kit. Don't forget that. Okay, kit. Size, I'll arrange a plane. We'll get, it. We'll, we'll get it sorted. Let's go. Nora, you and I both know I'm going to forget everything. I'll pack for you. Thank you. <laughs> That's why you need to start taking notes. Start learning that. I take notes at school. And you uh, still don't. Never mind. I'll give up. I I need some new folders. I think too much of these. But new um, folders. Can I also like I don't know, I need some people to carry my equipment. People? Yes. How else would I move a mobile lab to uh, work on the robots, right? We can get it onto the plane. Great. Good. Okay. People to move an entire lab onto a plane. No problem. Anything else? Oh, since you're asking. I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> um, <laughs> Let me cut away from that. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, but one thing Nora does realize that uh, she's going to need to do is uh, Barnes. Nora would spend days, weeks, even months crafting meticulous cover identities just for Barnes to walk in in a tuxedo and just yell loudly to everyone around as Barnes, James Barnes, or John Barnes. So... This is your moment. You can finally actually craft cover identities for your team and maybe, maybe not even be recognized as spies immediately upon entry. This is going to be great. Um, so uh, what, all you know so far uh, is that um, this is a uh, eccentric billionaire and a corporate owner is going to a private island retreat. He has invited a lot of prominent individuals. Uh, presumably quite a few of them are going to be uh, – in various positions of political power, uh, maybe also some entrepreneurs. Uh, so you need to have craft identities that would make sense to be in that kind of environment. Okay. I think, I think we'll be fine. Um, if anyone wants any input on their identities, otherwise I'm going to go ham. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think after a, mo a, a little while of getting ready, she'll bring you back together for a moment. And uh, she's got nice clothing set out for everyone. All right. I've got some cover identities sorted for you. Uh, if it doesn't suit, we can rearrange. <clears throat> All right. Um, let's see here. Um, Max, you are the son of an attache uh, to well, we'll not we'll not complicate things you're 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 a uh, diplomat son of a diplomatic ambassador uh from the united kingdom uh you you can come up with whatever sort or you know pick pick a country it doesn't really matter uh you're <laughs> running for uh office soon and you're trying to get um support but you're very popular uh in your constituency and you're 
family is powerful. How's that? Uh, I, I, I guess the camera would zoom in on note on like a notepad because I'm trying to take notes. Right. I do try. I try to, <laughs> you know, make the best of this opportunity. Uh, but it it's it's just like Ambassador Sun UK, Europe. Question mark, question mark, question mark. Scratch, scratch, scratch. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I've, I've obviously just like stopped halfway through what you were saying and I'm trying to think of the country I want to be from. Uh, <laughs> no, no, yeah, that, that I can, I, I, you know, it, it's simple and I appreciate that. Yep, yeah, uh, looks over. I'll write down some bullet points for you. <laughs> Powerful family, <laughs> wealthy, <laughs> political. Now, you want to get your start in politics, but you don't have to be smart about it. That's the thing about politics, sons and daughters. Here you go. And just slides it across. Um, now, <clears throat> Gabriel, I've set you up as a patron. Now, primarily of the arts, or at least that's what you're going to assert. You support multiple museums. Um, give you a small list here and slides a few museums over. You support multiple museums. However, it would be advantageous for your cover story and to get some interesting information if you're secretly a wealthy supporter of less uh, up and up projects. I trust you to be um, choosy with who you release that information to and maybe someone will uh open up what do you think i can easily do that it's like i was born for that perfect <laughs> now <clears throat> mcguffin i actually want to keep you pretty close to what you really are because there are robots here and i want to give you the opportunity you are Famous inventor. Well, maybe infamous. Scratches out famous, writes infamous. <laughs> You're an infamous inventor in certain circles. You have a speciality in robotics. And because of that, you've become well known amongst the elite because you can make their lives easier. Curtains that move on their own and lights that come on without anybody even touching anything. It's but again, just like our friend uh, Gabe, you have a bit of a more experimental side and you'd love to get your hands on some less boring work. What do you think? Yeah. Everything is better with lasers. I, I got a few additions and changes and we are seeing a, so a short scene of Alistair making a few suggestions and changes. And in the end, it's the same cover story. <laughs> okay. What are those? It's, it's just a, a, a brief moment. He makes of... changes and makes them back and ends up basically going back to exactly the same thing we started with. Yes. <laughs> and she sits there the whole time going, mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Every time we cut back to Nora, there's more coffee cups around her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, and um, for myself, um, I'm going with the uh, nepotism role as well. Uh, I'm going to be the daughter of a well-known performer, uh, an opera singer, because who actually knows names of opera singers and i'm going to be trying to make my way in that industry so the two of us uh max you and i will be our cover is networking and we can know each other in case you need any um <clears throat> backup gabriel will turn look at max check his watch three to no nothing max <laughs> i'm like i'm obviously just trying not to say something i'm just like squirming <laughs> and like one finger just rapidly tapping the pen on my notepad as i'm trying to hold it in thank you nora <laughs> uh as a note uh, i've given you a rewrite for that fantastic cover story scene that was amazing thank you <laughs> um 
uh, as you're, as you're, thank you guys for letting me uh, <laughs> stupid cover stories for you. Uh, as you're wrapping up your cover stories, there's knock at the door. Um, you open it up, and there's another robotic pigeon sitting outside the door. You're not sure how he knocked on the door, but whatever. That was my question. <laughs> <laughs> whom the pigeon knocks, I guess. Uh, and attached to his leg are uh, four tickets to a cruise ship uh, heading for Isla Fraga. Nice. Oh god, how am I going to get the lab on that? <laughs> you don't. Uh, <laughs> MacGuffin, anyway, you can invent a mobile lab in 48 hours? With some minor changes, <laughs> <laughs> that might be possible. <laughs> and I leave the scene. <laughs> I hope he's not hoping that I help him smuggle it on board like last time. I'm still finding beaker shards. <laughs> In uncomfortable places. <laughs> we don't talk about those places. Um, uh, so the tickets are uh, for a uh, private uh, luxury cruise line um, uh, so that uh, allows you to get to from where you're at to Isla Fraga. Um, how they're taking a ship from an undisclosed uh, Western European country to Costa Rica, a little unclear, but whatever. The, the budget wouldn't be stretched to include a, a flight uh, scene in the actual footage. So, yeah, what you got. Uh, so, is there anything your character is doing for the next two days in preparation for going on to this cruise? Make sure that his uh, suite is upgraded because we have to travel in style. You actually are already at, at uh, have VIP uh, on each of these. Even um, better. Uh, uh, under spends money in very strange ways, but uh, Barnes always insisted that his team traveled in the best possible combinations. Nora's just packing for herself and everything she thinks someone else might forget. <laughs> so lots of bags. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Just going to go with the, uh, oh, I'm a performing woman. I need all of this stuff. <laughs> Uh, is are you going to anyone going to try to smuggle weapons onto the ship or gadgets onto the ship? Yeah. <laughs> I'm spending two days on uh, building gadgets and weapons and stuff. All the the suitcases, all the watches, all the pens. <laughs> um, the, the, and, what 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 I'll say is that um, uh, because we have the. Uh, the cinematic of um, where is it? That, not just a pen uh, is that we'll just use that to explain is that you each get one free activation per character of turning something mundane in your character into a gadget. Then after that, it will cost you each additional one will cost you the one rewrite as normal. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, and then and then also uh, you're just gonna have just like because this is 1960s miniaturization is not really a thing yet. Uh, so you're gonna have to. Uh, Come up with a way to explain why you're moving extremely large metal crates onto a luxury ship. At least your cover story uh, helps. Right. Sorry, um, it it ha uh, my large crates uh, do have bumper stickers on them saying "definitely not a robot." Oh, there you go. Perfect. Airtake air cover story. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> but I mean. You know, and Nora's like, <laughs> while everyone's getting ready, she's like, I'm not going to be able to help you while we're there. So just remember, <laughs> you make robotics. That's that's your that's your thing. You don't need too far of a. Yeah, it'll be fine. It <laughs> is looking at the crates like, oh, dear God. <laughs> be fine. We're not fine. <laughs> um. Uh, but yeah, just to confirm, uh, so no one's going to try to sneak mundane weapons on. You're going to rely on your um, gadgetry. Oh. Nope. Nope. Oh, okay. Definitely I would begging. just try to sneak a gun on. But okay. if somebody confronts me with it, got excuses. Uh, okay, Paul. We'll so make sure to have some uh, weaponry on him. Uh, definitely a pistol. Okay. If possible, a knife as well. And if people ask, uh, bad neighborhood. Bad experiences, force of habit, you know, the usual. Uh, okay. Um, uh, we're sticking to like pistols, knives, nothing like 
No submachine guns, <laughs> rockets, tanks. No. Okay. Screwdriver. I don't know. Screwdriver is pretty risky, but uh, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. Long time viewers know that the Max is more of a brawler and he just always seems to happen to find something that works as a weapon in a pinch. Oh, there we go. Nice. Nice. Like many of my other characters, uh, Nora is skilled in uh, casting gun. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough. Then, um, uh, so note somewhere that you're regular is the day of pistol. Um, uh, Gabriel also does have a knife. And everyone else is going, relying on your, your gadgetry, which has never failed you in past episodes, except for that one time. But we don't, we don't show that episode anymore. Uh, okay, then uh, you make your way onto uh, the ship. Uh, and uh, all of you, particularly Nora, are like a little nervous because uh, there's a lot of strange things you're trying to put onto this ship and so you're ready for maybe they're going to be metal detectors or security guards and they're going to want to see paperwork which you think you have you're pretty good you, you, you've done a lot of work in forging that kind of paperwork um you've got id cards and you've typed up dossiers for everybody and uh you walk up to the ship and there are two guards in uniforms there and they look at you and they go yeah go on in, and just walk right in with everything perfect Thanks, Gabe, will, Gabe will almost look sad that they didn't stop him. Like, look, Speak we're on. Here. I gotta prove myself, but <laughs> reluctantly moves on. Uh, and uh, the next uh, week goes by. Um, it's a very comfortable trip. Um, there are a couple of uh, minor conflicts. Uh, one person uh, decided they get curious about the metal crate, tried to open it, uh, and the burns are healing nicely. So that, that, that's working out well. Um, uh, one person uh, tried to play Gabriel in a game of blackjack. Uh, Gabriel lost. And again, the, the, the minor concussion, but otherwise uh, the loser is doing well now. Uh, but then you make it to is the Fraga. Uh, and it is... Everything you could imagine of a tropical paradise on a 1960s ITV budget could give you. Uh, it um, like it, Gilligan's Island over here, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, it is totally not shot in a studio. What are you talking about? Uh, uh, but there are uh, sandy beaches. Um, there's uh, music playing in the air, although you can't see musicians because they just are playing records in the background over the loudspeakers. Um, uh, there are fireworks in the air, which is totally not stock footage that's being reused. Uh, but there are lots of people here as well. Um, and as soon as you get off the ship, uh, the first thing you notice is that while there are maybe 40 or 50 people milling about the islands, uh, a fair number of them do appear to be all wearing, uh, support staff uniforms. Uh, so, um, lots of, uh, black and blue kind of coordinated outfits. Um, uh, women are wearing uh, skirts and high heels, even in sandy beaches. Uh, the men are wearing uh, flat shoes. Um, they're polished and it's getting sands in their socks and on their shoes and everywhere. Uh, and uh, we also noticed that there's lots of statues and there are uh, paintings hanging on walls and there are posters uh, and they're all of the same man. They're all images of the same man, which is uh, Nestoria Petrazzo. Uh, he is uh, subtle and uh, not at all uh, egotistical. He, he he gives to his people and he's want to make sure that they understand and recognize the, the benevolence he gives to them throughout his island that he owns. Uh, so you, uh, are directed by the staff, um, who again, just don't even look at your carefully meticulously uh, hidden items. They just take everything off the ship and start schlopping it. Uh, and they, they take you to the place called, uh, the Arcadia Resort. Uh, and the, res the Arcadia Resort is actually, uh, a complex, uh, there's uh, a main hotel, uh, with lots of kind of wooden uh, walkways that lead to other smaller uh, residences and bungalows uh, that are dotted around. Um, and all of that is facing uh, one of the many uh, beautiful uh, ocean views 
that the island offers you. And the hotel is, again, it's it's what you would expect from a luxury resort. Uh, there are folding chairs up by the pool. Um, there are people uh, with, with trays offering drinks to people who are lounging around. Uh, there are um, a bar with a waking or any kind of drink as long as it isn't some kind of fake coconut. Uh, it's everything you could possibly imagine. Uh, and you are each taken to a uh, separate little uh, bungalow cabin area. So you're each given a separate cabin that you can exist in, um, which means that for for three of you, uh, it's a pretty roomy place that has a, a bed and a dresser, maybe a small kitchenette, toilet and whatnot. Uh, and then there's uh, MacGuffins, which is kind of just chock a block full of absolutely everything and you can kind of maybe get through to get to the bed uh but it, otherwise it's just wall-to-wall -wall crates just all somehow managed to be shoved inside this one bungalow yeah sleep is for those who don't have enough tea it's <laughs> just the simple so uh you're now on the island uh you can unpack you can put your things well most of you can unpack uh, and put your things away. Uh, what would you like to do first? Okay, we'll look at Max. Need a hand just so that you're get comfortable. No, no, I I've got this. And then cut back to the um the boat and then the like small cabin I had. Uh, I had you know like a, a conspiracy wall. <laughs> I've clearly been trying to construct a fake family tree. Like everything is meticulously planned in detail. And this is something that again, long time viewers would know. Max does this. He wants to be good at what he does, but in the moment it's just all out of the window. Um so it's like <laughs> then there's there's a zoom in to the to the bedroom and he's got he's kind of just shoved it under the bed in an effort to hide it, but the, the board is too big. There's no way it would have fit in his luggage anyway, but you know, it's just sticking it's too big to hide to hide properly and um back to, to Gabriel is like no, actually, I've I've got this for once. I think I hope maybe. Um, thank you for the offer, though. It's, it's appreciated. We should definitely work as a team, uh, and we will. Um, oh, what was it? What was it? What was it? Burn said, uh, "Evil will rue the day that under interfered." That was it, right? I think that was it. Close. You're you're getting there. You're getting there. I think I'm sure Nora would be proud of you. I think I need a coconut. I actually saw a few outside. But before you run off, make sure that everything is okay. The whole plan falls on you. No pressure. Nothing at all. Well, you've Dra got this. Dramatic sting zoom in on the widening eyes. <laughs> <laughs> and Gabe will casually walk out like he owns the place, like he's made for this. Awesome. Uh, so you're going to the bar, the bar to get some more coconut drinks. Definitely. Um, and uh, you see a guy behind the bar, and he, uh, tall, uh, handsome, uh, short brown hair. Uh, the only one of the staff who's wearing like, a loud, uh, clashing Hawaiian shirt. And he goes, "Hey, everybody, how are you doing? Glad you can make it. Uh, is there anything I can get for you?" I'd like a coconut I'm Sam, drinks. by the way. Hi, Sam. I'm Max. Uh, yeah, I, I'm in the mood for your finest coconut. Um, chopped, not diced. Oh, uh, yeah, I, I make I make a great uh, coconut juice cocktail. If you want to try that, sounds fantastic. And uh, he uh, pulls like suddenly from beneath the bar a uh, machete, uh, and Gabriel immediately like goes into action. <laughs> Uh, but he swipes the machete and it just cuts the top off of a coconut and puts the machete back under the bar uh, and then uh, starts pouring the juice out into a cup and then uh, takes some a couple of chunks and pulls them out and throws them in there as well and then adds liquor from a bunch of different bottles and shakes it up and puts it in front of you with an umbrella in it. There you go. Give it a try. See what you think. Uh, I, I pick it up and I I I regard it carefully for a few moments as i've seen bonds do and then i'll i'll drink it 
uh, cough a little bit, as I imagine is quite strong. Oh, yeah, it's very strong. It, 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 it's at 90% alcohol and 2% coconut. Yes. That's, that's, mm. Oh, that's, that's, that's something. That is definitely a drink from a coconut. That, that's everything I expected. I think um, Nora will probably walk up to the bar at this point. Um, I mean, I'm leaning into the 60s trope. It's like the slinky dress. Uh, yes. just, I'm a spy. Right, just <laughs> wrap around, yeah. Yep. <laughs> and she's like, oh, uh, are you making drinks? Of course, anything for you, ma'am. What did you like? My name's Sam, by the way. Oh, um, I'm Cardelia. Nice to meet you. Um, I'd love something with coffee. Of course. Uh, do you want it Irish or straight? What about a espresso martini? Sure. Uh, and pulls out a, a coffee maker from behind the bar and starts uh, grinding beans uh, as he also pulls out uh, the makings of the martini. And uh, he's, he's chatting the whole time, but he's going to actually uh, grind the beans, brew the coffee, wait for it to cool down, uh, then use ice to chill it before he adds the martini together. So it takes like 20 minutes to make this drink. Uh, yeah, Nora's going <laughs> to turn um, turn to Max as well and be like, Hi, I'm Cardelia. Nice to meet you. What's your name? You've caught me mid-sip, so... <laughs> <laughs> Max, this is... A Strong coconut, but I, I I put the coconut down on the table, and the table just rocks ever so slightly. Um, and then, oh. yes, uh, uh, my father um, sent me here to, to get me on the the the, oh, the fast track. There we go to, to to my career. Well, there are going to be plenty of influential people here, so I'm sure that he made the right decision, Max. I, Realizes then that she didn't give anyone a fake name. <laughs> <laughs> How obvious is that realization? I think there's just like a deep intake of breath, then it could be literally she's she's not staring at him at the time so she's but she's definitely like <laughs> so how obvious that would be to uh is it sam the bartender sam at the, as soon as you do that uh sam is actually uh behind the bar because uh he's trying to actually chop ice from an ice block so he completely misses the entire bit brilliant <laughs> she's like mm, well great um it's good to meet you, Max. I hope you find the success you're looking for. And I, uh, I, I reach for the for the oh, drink, <laughs> recognizing that the conversation is 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 winding up. This this small talk, and say, "Don't worry, I've got this." And then I just wink. Like there's no there's no subtlety about it. It's the eye. The most subtle thing about it is it's the eye furthest away from the bartender. It's just <laughs> charming. <laughs> kind of just starts staring at the bartender like where's my drink uh, uh there's like now like five or six people around you who are all clearly waiting for a drink and sam is just completely ignoring his focus now on making this martini as requested she uh, actually she, she's like where's my drink but then she realizes everyone else is waiting and she's like <laughs> And just kind of adopts the the biggest like yeah he's making my drink face that she can possibly make. Uh, as you're, uh, unless I was doing anything else during this just ludicrously long drink ritual. <laughs> um, uh, at one point, uh, a, a woman uh, steps over. Uh, she's wearing a uh, a nicer version of the staff uniform. Um, she actually has epaulets on her shoulders, um, and she gets to wear uh, trousers and sensible shoes. Uh, and uh, she walks up uh, and goes, Sam, Sam, Sam. And Sam's like, I'm making a drink song. What can I do? It's like, Sam, there are six people waiting for drinks. And Sam's like, I know, but I have to make this drink for this lady right here. And it's like, Sam, you spent 15 minutes making this drink. It's like, but it, it, I'm just doing what I was told. And she's like, finish the drink, get to the other customers. And so he's finally just... <sighs> fine and just throws everything into a, uh, a mug and hands it to you and it's like i'm sorry i couldn't make it the way i wanted to make it for you i'm sure it's lovely thanks sam and just kind of 
Is it any good? <laughs> it is vile. It, it, I mean, there's bits of coffee beans <laughs> still in it. Um, uh, I, I mean, the martini bits are are heavy on, yeah, you know, just way too much gin. Um, it's it's oily, it, which I don't know how that happened exactly. Yeah, just kind of like, and just like, <laughs> this is great. Could I get a whiskey on the rocks, please? <laughs> uh, sure. And the song is like, no, other customers first. And he's like, mm-hmm. oh yeah, okay. And so the customers are starting to to, to queue up and, and place their orders. She's going to call the other lady over. And this is, I think, some sort of sadism because she realizes this woman is just the staff version of her. Right. Um, <laughs> She's like, yes, can I help you? And you see her, her badge says uh, Zongfei Concierge. This is terrible. I'm not surprised, but I'm sorry. Can I get a whiskey, please? Uh, yes, of course. I will, I will uh, have a bottle sent to your, your bungalow right away. Thank you. And she walks off. Uh, so nice not to be on that side of things for once. Uh, Gabriel, what are you doing during all this? Uh, he'll make sure to check up on uh, uh, Alistair as well. Okay. Opens the door. Instantly closes it again. Seeing <laughs> all the stuff in there, knowing not even going to touch that shit. <laughs> um, he'll contemplate for a moment and then he'll just casually walk into town. If okay. that's possible. Sure. Um, we'll quick, quickly cut to Alistair. Uh, what is Alistair doing? So, <clears throat> as his cover required, he added a bow tie to his lab coat. Oh, very good. And um, he uh, ventured into um, some sort of foyer of uh, the place that we are at. Mm-hmm. And I like to find other lab coat people. Okay. Uh, so you start to, to uh, walk in again, the, the actual, the hotel, the main hotel that kind of is part of this, this resort. Um, it's, it's studying with lots of, of uh, marble columns, uh, uh, deep uh, Persian rugs. There's uh, a, a large kind of, a foyer, but there's like tables off the side so people can talk. There's a sm- there's another yet another bar inside uh, the hotel. Uh, there's a telephone room uh, so people can ha- make telephone calls in private. Uh, and of course, uh, two grand staircases, both arching up. Uh, you can go ahead and make a let's call it technology and cunning to try to recognize people who are also technologically inclined. Awesome. Um <clears throat> and uh well I am I'm looking for our trademark, the lab code. So I'd say I've something for exactly this occasion, which would mm-hmm. be one of my quips okay. as it apply. All right. Uh, then that will give you additional die to your roll. And right. if this succeeds, that means if you use it again, it will add two dice. Uh so it was technology and uh technology and cunning. Yeah. This one doesn't want to roll. So it's it's three successes. Okay. Uh, so you don't see anybody with a, a lab coat, which is obviously immediately disappointing. Um, uh, but one thing that's interesting is that as you're walking through the hotel lobby looking for your fellow colleagues, you do get a strong smell of ozone which is something that you generally associate with uh, uh, electrical engineering, not hotel lobbies. Although, granted, you've not had a lot of experience with luxury hotel lobbies. Not for long, at least. And sometimes they smell of ozone afterwards. So, Right. I mean, but, but there's been no gunfights or gadgetry yet. So that's the part that was a little surprising to you. So, so someone is involved with technology here in the lobby area. Yeah. Can I can I identify the source of the smell? Or it's just a general thing that's going on. Uh, yes, it looks like it's coming from the uh, telephone room. Basically, the, the, the telephone rooms um, are just they're they're slightly bigger than a, a booth, 
Um, so there's like a, a small bench there as well as a table with a phone booth on it and a telephone sitting next to it and a little kind of glass sliding door uh, and it just says telephone on it. Um, but that's where the smell's coming from. Hmm. Interesting. I go to the uh, telephone room. Completely not suspicious at all. I'm, I'm taking a good look around if anybody is observing me. And then I enter the the room. Mm -hmm. No one seems to be looking directly at you now. Great. Because I'm wearing a great cover. You are. Doing so good. <laughs> so good. So good my job. Yes. Um, and you sit down and, and the smell uh, is starting to fade, but it, it's like briefly stronger when you open the door. Um, but then it's 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 fading, um, mm. partially probably because you opened the door. Uh, but it looks just like there's a, a red telephone. There's a, a phone book, um, which is not very big because not many places you call on the island. Uh, there's a small table and there's like a red leather bench. Right. I'm starting looking through the phone book for uh, um, searching for the code that I have to enter in the phone to activate the secret elevator. It's almost like you've seen these kinds of things before. <laughs> uh, so you start to um, uh, flip through uh, and you, uh, there's, there's, uh, there are a few, different things. there's obviously the um, uh, Petrazzo's phone number for his mansion. Um, there's a number of other names you don't recognize. Uh, there's apparently a casino uh there's a museum uh and then you see a phone number for the jungle hmm. and as it you know jungles have phone service do they no they usually don't i'm hmm. we don't have phones do we have any sort of communications i, I didn't think so uh it's pigeons <laughs> right. If yeah. you want to, you can use your uh, free activation to turn one of your gadgets into a communication device. Yeah. So um, I I gonna get a metal matchbox out of my left coat bo uh, pocket. Okay. Press a few buttons on it, mm -hmm. and the writer for this episode is getting so much shade from the prop department because it turns into a mechanical sparrow that we use only <laughs> once in this show. And this is this <laughs> very moment. Oh god, yes, that's at the end. Like I have to, I have to build a what? <laughs> and um, I, I have the sparrow. I I. Take a piece of paper, uh, writing down, I am in the jungle, A uh, M C G, and that's all. Binding it to the sparrow, opening the door a little bit, sending it away, and then I'm going to push in the number for the jungle to the phone, and we cut probably to another agent. Yeah, we know. Yeah, that, 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 we cut away as you do that. Um, and and uh, so you start to use the rotary dial to put the number in. Uh, and the sparrow flies off, uh, and we go back to uh, Gabriel. Um, starting to, you have found a map actually uh, as you were looking around uh, a map of the islands, which uh, points out uh, that the, the the docks lead to the resort. That's where you've been so far. Uh, nearby is the Pygmalion Casino, uh, and then there's uh, the mansion, uh, which is Petrasso's mansion. That's home. Uh, there is a place known as the Petrazzo Museum. And then uh, around it, uh, near kind of the northern part of the island is kind of a crescent. It's just a place marked the jungle. Cool. So considering my um, cover story is museum, I'm going to the casino. Okay. Uh, okay. So kind of just the whole flair, still comfortable happy um we'll go up to the bar order a rum cola but ho hold the cola the cola. okay <laughs> uh, uh and the casino is uh like, again super stylish it, it's right out of uh 60s las vegas kitsch um uh the whole thing's kind of uh done in uh, ancient greece uh by someone who probably has a very sketchy understanding of how ancient greece actually looked or worked 
but it is definitely just much more uh, a way to kind of frame lots of slot machines and card tables and the like. And there's absolutely is like several bars uh, around the casino. And uh, the, the the bartender, which uh, looks a lot like Sam, uh, um, <laughs> makes you the drink. Although uh, he has a different shirt on, so therefore it must be a completely different character. Oh, absolutely. Um, so he'll kind of, once he has the uh, rum coke without the coke, turn, uh, lean against the bar and just briefly glance over the whole casino. Okay. Uh, one thing you notice is that the whole casino is pointing towards a stage, uh, which seems a bit odd. Um, usually casinos like have their stage like separate from the rest of the casino. Uh, but you know, there's only so much room you could put into the sound stage when you're filming these kind of episodes. Uh, and uh, as you turn around to look, um, the lights kind of dim, and uh, a beautiful auburn haired woman comes out. Uh, she's wearing a, a stunning, elegant silver dress. Uh, and uh, she starts to sing. Uh, she sings this, uh, this beautiful song, uh, and it's a poignant and beautiful love song. It's also a little sad. Uh, you get the impression that uh, she's uh, putting her emotion into the song, but there, there's a there's a, a a layer or a depth of melancholy here that you can't quite place. And you just kind of transported away with the song. I kind of want to use a rewrite. Okay. So Gabe and Nora will be walking into the casino. And considering Nora's background as opera singer, um, I want the current singer that kind of started before um, lose a few notes. And then Gabe kind of pushes Nora up front so that she can start singing and showcase her uh, skills. Uh, okay. Um, as a player, go for it. As Nora, oh shit! <laughs> right, right. Um, so we'll call that uh, uh, one to bring Nora into the scene. It's not a problem. And then uh, one to uh, take directorial control to to have the song not go as as well as originally intended. Yeah, so the, the goal is kind of that while this happens, mm -hmm. Gabe can try sneak away okay. and try to get somewhere backstage, see how and what, and uh, try to get some more information if possible. Okay. Um, so uh, as the song starts, uh, Nora enters the scene. Um, the writers forgot to write a joining scene as to why Nora's here. They, they ran out of time before they started building, so she's just here now. Uh, it, and um, uh, she, uh, the the one on stage, she starts to sing, and then uh, suddenly, almost mysteriously, she she starts she coughs, uh, and, and the, the room goes silent. They're just stunned, and then she goes, "I'm sorry, I I can't continue." And then she flees backstage, and and uh. Gabriel's like, come on, she should go. <sighs> Nora's convinced slash frog marched onto the stage. This is when you find out that Nora, the character, has absolutely no reason to know how to sing, but <laughs> the uh, the cast, uh, play, the one who plays Nora, actually, like, sings. <laughs> and so they were like, oh, we've got to make an excuse for this in, in the show. <laughs> right, right. The actor has been like, listen, I've, I've done all your nonsense for a season now. I want to see where I can sing. <laughs> Um, so what am I going to be rolling to not totally flub this? Uh, let's call this, uh, uh, I'll allow either culture or persuasion. Okay. And I'm going to go persuasion. <laughs> and presence. Okay, persuasion and presence. And as a note, you now have two rewrites left. Cool. Um, uh, my rolling tray's over there, so you're about to hear a really loud clacking. I apologize. Actually, let me just mute it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. Um, one, two. Do tens explode or count as double in this? Count as double. Cool. That's four successes. Wow. Okay. Um, Including uh, the one ten. So. So that's uh, difficulty two. Um, so you uh, successfully 
uh, entrance the crowd. Cool. Uh, and you have and you have two additional hits. Um, so uh, you can, uh, if you'd like, you can carry on one of the notes a little longer, do the refrains a little bit longer. Ways to kind of give uh, Gabriel more time to sneak backstage. Yeah, um, I think if it's similar to other story path systems with the two additional, I'll take one to elongate, you know, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll do the extra long Lovey and Rose. And, yes. um, <laughs> and then the other one, I'd like to kind of really start playing the crowd a little bit so that I can get some connections. Um, maybe someone important that might come to try and talk to me. So she's doing the whole like, hold me close and hold me fast. And like really just kind of, <laughs> yeah. and kind well, of trying is... to make that eye connection with everybody. Like. Absolutely. Um, uh, I'll say that you've increased the attitude of the room by one. Um, so that was gonna be easier to get connections with them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> see? All works out perfectly. Yeah, again, the character, no reason to be able to sing. Right. Like crap that went into psychology. I don't know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, so, uh, Gabriel, you sneak backstage. Um, are you going to try to track down the singer that fled the stage, or are you just going to investigate what's going on back here? Oh, no, definitely going for a singer. Okay. Um, uh, so, so you see her, and she's crying in her uh, room. Um, and you see on the side of the door, it says uh, Josephine Bovier, and there's a star above it. Um, and she's just kind of head down over her uh, makeup table, crying, sobbing. So he'll just knock, doesn't wait for an answer, and just barges in. She looks up and it's like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, to bother you. Oh, no, that, that's fine. That's fine. Just wanted to make sure that as an admirer that you're all just fine. I saw what happened and... I couldn't sit idly by for you. I know how challenging it can be at times. Uh, go ahead and make um, persuasion and uh, manipulation because you're lying to her. Yep. <laughs> and I'm going to roll her. Do I need to sense bullshit? Right. Difficulty is two. Uh, three successes. Okay. Um, unless you have a, a somebody you want to spend that last hit on, we'll just say that that increases her attitude by one to yep, you as that, well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, <clears throat> she starts to say, "No, I'm I'm fine," and then just throws herself into your arms, sobbing. It's okay. It's okay. I like. like I'm I said, sorry. Just it's been so long since I've had a man who's shown any kind of concern about me uh, so Petrazzo just he just ignores me and I, I sing for him every night but he doesn't even look at me he's just so focused on his, his gambling and his plans and I don't know what to do I mean we're, we're all here for you everyone believes in you don't lose any faith do you need a plus one for tonight she, uh, support. she sniffles and, and uh, she kind of pulls back and starts to dab at her face. It's like, no, no, thank you, but I wouldn't I wouldn't want to endanger, I mean, inconvenience you. Oh, no. You would never endanger me. I just say the words and I'll be there. She uh, let me check real quick. Uh, where is she? she hands you a uh, a key, and uh, she's like, "Tonight, uh, come by the mansion, and I can." Well, while he's out gambling, we can talk more. It sounds like a plan, and he'll flashes her a smile, like only a true super spy can do. Absolutely. <laughs> and walk out again. Uh, we cut. Oh, go ahead. He'll, he'll, he'll step back into the room just as uh, Nora finishes singing. Like, it's Perfect. everything is perfectly timed. Perfect time. So you two are together. We're going to cut now to Max, see how Max is doing. Um, Nora will look over her shoulder, see him come out, and, like, make nice, like, thank you, thank you. Give me <laughs> <a little bit. laughs> 
I read it. Uh, Max is doing his best to imagine what John Barnes would do in this situation. And as far as Max mm. is concerned, that is lounge around on a beach drinking a, a coconut and just expect that anyone interesting will find their way eventually to him. In Max's um, experience, this usually results in, you know, a fight occurring. And he's really hoping that this fantastic paradise island is going to be the exception to that because the set just can't handle it they've, they've, they've gone way over budget on the tiny <laughs> sparrow that he knows the moment that a sun toucher is thrown into the nearby palm tree the entire thing's coming down and they're gonna have to do a get do another take <laughs> okay uh so you are uh lounging on the beach and uh you're kind of just building the flow chart in your head of, of what would Barnes do. And say, okay, if I'm attacked by one guy, I'm going to do this. If I'm attacked by two guys, I'm going to do this. If I'm attacked by one guy with a knife and one guy with a gun, I'm going to do this third thing. Um, and just really trying to map out absolutely every possibility in your head. Uh, and suddenly you hear a voice behind you saying, excuse me, can I talk to you for a second? Didn't even know they were there. You were so lost in your mind map that you had no idea someone walked up on you. Um, so, yeah, I was, I was, I was raising the coconut to my, to my lips just an abs for an absent sip, and I, I've learned from, the, from, from, from Nora's approach, and I carefully pull the coconut down. I'm not coughing this time. Good job. And I turn. I turn. Uh, yes, how may I help you? Uh, and you see uh, a woman, uh, she's wearing a, a lab coat. Um, uh, she has a uh, uh, certain... Uh, slacks underneath of it. Uh, she's got kind of short, uh, bobbed hair, a little bit of uh, grease on her nose. And she's like, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to bother you, but um, have you by chance seen a A15 flange around here anywhere? I got to lean suavely on the table and miss and just kind of like just awkwardly <laughs> stumble. Um, I assure you, if I had, I would tell you where it was. Okay, but well... If you do, um, my name's Marlene, uh, and I really do need the flange for... And then she stops and goes, research? Uh, research is important. Perhaps if you told me what this, this A15 flange looked like, I could keep my eyes out around this glorious resort. And oh, yeah, sure, no problem. Uh, the A15 flange, is, it's, it's almost like the A13 flange. The exception is that there's a, the thread goes counterclockwise as opposed to clockwise. Everyone makes that mistake. It happens all the time. But it's definitely not as big as the A17 flange. The A17 flange is way too big, and I don't even know why they made it. It's just ludicrously large. And she goes on for like 15 minutes describing all the benefits of the A15 flange, but never gets around to actually describing what it looks like. I, I, I'm kind of imagining that the camera ke keeps cutting between her talking and then right. like a tinnitus whine, which is all <laughs> that Max is actually hearing. That is fantastic. And I'm sure that your research is incredibly valuable. If I, uh, if I find the flange, Marlene, was it? Marlene. I know exactly who to bring it to. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Bye. And she walks off the beach. I look around the beach. Can I see anything that looks out of place that might feasibly be a flange? Bearing in mind, Max has no idea what a flange even is. In like, um, you don't see you don't see any flange. Um, uh, you do see her kind of walking back towards to the jungle. Uh, and then you hear a metallic door slam. I assume this is like she's out of sight for a moment and then... The yeah, yeah, she disappears slam. and then you hear a, a slam of a metallic door in the, from the jungle. Uh, so I look in that direction, like dramatic stare, cock my head, look around, realize for the first time, this episode at least, that I am completely alone. None of my... Mm -hmm. None of the team are here. What would... No, not what would Barnes do. What would Nora do? And then we'll cut away from that. Uh, and uh, we'll go back to uh, MacGuffin, uh, who is in the process of plummeting down into a metallic chute. 
that is sliding you around uh, left, right. Uh, at what point you flip upside down? But it's really just the camera kind of rotating in different directions as you make shaking noises. Uh, and then uh, you land on a pile of mattresses, and you are in a series of concrete and metal tunnels. Uh, looks like it, one time uh, might have been kind of uh, transport tunnels that they use to ship uh, large delicate equipment. So you're very familiar with these kinds of tunnels usually. Uh, there's not much to distinguish. There's no signage there's no uh, uh arrows pointing anywhere it, it just looks like it, it's a, it's a long concrete corridor going off into the distance and uh as soon as you land on the uh mattresses um a light comes on over you and then uh, in front of you and you know another light and another light and another light you know, lighting up the, the corridor in front of you well this doesn't look like any jungle that i know may have been lied to that should be a quip <laughs> keep it for yeah. future yeah uh so you follow the corridor yes very much so and i'm uh, and uh pretty quickly you notice that there are lots of metal doors all the way down the corridor none of them are marked um but they're all big heavy metallic sliding doors uh and after a short walk you do see one's actually slightly uh open uh looks like something's been jammed into it so it couldn't close completely yeah uh i on the way there i'd like to have a peek into one of the rooms and the camera doesn't show what's in there but mm -hmm. i'm mumbling under my breath well that's a room full of flanches who would need all of those <laughs> You anticipated me because that is, in fact, what is cut this door open is, in fact, an A15 flange, which you immediately recognize. Very important for robotic research. Yeah, but it's, it's definitely inferior to the A17. Well, everybody Obviously, knows. everyone knows that, yes. You, you just need the length. It's too, too, too wide. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to snatch one. Okay. Door shut. And um, is there anything else? In the Door room? opens. Uh, and you see uh, a woman with kind of short bob haircut with uh, a trench, uh, a lab coat and goes, uh, hi, can you help me? Oh, wait, you have an A15 flange. I've been looking for that. Uh, sure. Yes, that's why I'm here. Excellent, excellent. Hi, um, I'm, I'm Marlene. I don't know if we've met. I haven't seen you around before, but I really, I, I've been looking for that everywhere. Um, the, is did you find that? Is that yours? Can I borrow it? Oh, I can't borrow it. Can I, can I have it, or can I get another one like it? You know, for science. Thank you. Uh, it comes attached to uh, Alison McGuffin, world famous robot scientist. I think I've heard of you before. Didn't you invent the um the oh what am I what is it? She's clearly fishing for you to fill in that gap. <laughs> yeah, um, I invented the automated chair. Right. Yes, I, I think I read your paper on that. Definitely <laughs> an increase in 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 chair technology. I. Uh I certainly think so, yes. So, so um, what are you working on here? This looks so, like some nice piece of technology. Oh, I'm just doing some research. Uh, my father started a while ago, um, uh, Dr. Kiefer. Uh, and uh, you know, Marlene Kiefer, that's, that's my name, so Dr. Kiefer, right? Because that's my father. Uh, uh, but no, he, he, he did some things before he, he passed on. So I'm just kind of just finishing up his work. It's a little side project. Nothing I don't want to bother a world famous inventor like you with. It's a little side project, side track going. Well, I think uh, Professor Kiefer, it was, right? Got yes. some world famous recognition on some area, so I wouldn't deem any of his projects minor. Uh, if you if you'd like, you can make a uh, technology and intellect role to see if you've heard of this Doctor Keeper. Well, okay, that's definitely better than pretending. <laughs> uh, so, so. 
Uh, one success. Okay. Um, you do remember hearing about a Dr. Stefan Kiefer, um, uh, who is a roboticist, uh, but um, he apparently died of natural causes earlier this year. You don't know much beyond that, though. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I'm very sorry. I just recently heard uh, of his loss. So, uh, of your oh, loss. It it it, it happens. Um, you know, these things are, you know, uh, the way of life. But uh, I'm just I'm just really excited that I can carry on his his research and 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 continue what he loved to do. Um, I think a great mind like his should be on it. So, um. Maybe you'd like to like to um show what you're working on. Oh, 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 I, I I'm sorry, I can't. You know how it is. Uh, you know, there's there's people I need to talk to and I have to get clearance from them and then I have to talk to uh, uh, Mr. Petrazzo because it's proprietary information for his company and whatnot. So, I mean, but, but if you want, I can talk to Mr. Petrazzo and I could see if I can get you that clearance. Well, this sounds like a splendid idea. You know what? What you should do, I think he's going to have dinner at his mansion tonight. Why don't you go there, and then we can talk about it there and see if I can work something out. Smile freezes. <laughs> okay, talk to you later. Bye! And then walks through the door and closes behind her. Uh, Great. I'm uh, looking for form for formal social events. It must be something that I can give to people that they are taking care of that for me. Excellent. Uh, I'm going to pause to uh, give you guys another rewrite for keeping the party completely apart, which is great. <laughs> uh, and we're going to actually cut back to, to Ryan uh, real quick. Um, uh, so the uh, you heard this metallic door slam shut as you were in the jungle. Yes, uh, after that brief moment of indecision, I would take a fortifying um, sip. Like th I'd finish the coconut, essentially. Uh, right. Cough, uh, and then head with purpose and such a veneer of confidence that no one could possibly doubt I'm going heading in the direction I should be heading and, and try to I just stride directly into the jungle, assuming that I'll trip over something useful along the way. It does seem to be how these things go. Uh, and I start to walk into the jungle. Uh, and uh, because you heard where the sound came from and uh, you've been trained by Barnes himself to be able to, to echo, use echolocation to find where any sound comes from, uh, you do find that one of the trees in the jungle looks a little different from the others. Uh, there's actually... Um, uh, a part of the brand, uh, the uh, word, word, bark, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, the bark of the tree uh, actually feels metallic as you run your hand over it. Uh, I will proceed to spend an appropriate amount of time just kind of wrapping on it, figuring out where the door, like the limits of the door, and then step back and, oh, look, the cracks in the bark make a door shape now, somehow. Uh, and right. then try to, using that information, figure out how I could attempt to open it. Uh, so you start to kind of get field edges around it, um, and then uh, you notice that uh, one of the branches uh, is conveniently kind of curved down to make a handle, and so you pull it, and then the whole thing swings right open. And underneath, inside you see there's a, a staircase going down, and a light appears somehow inside of this tree over the staircase. I'll take one last look at the uh, the glorious tropical vista that has been th hastily thrown together by the prop department just to get another use out of it more than anything. <laughs> and I step in as the door ominously closes behind me. Uh, and as you step down the staircase, um, lights appear in front of you as you walk down a, a concrete corridor. And there's another metal door in front of you. Do you swing open confidently? Do you Ease it open and peek around. 
yeah, no, it's 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 being open confidently. There's 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 no subtlety really to Max. And longtime viewers of the show are like, they they usually have a a, a poll of whether he'll like try to push a pull door or pull a push door first, <laughs> because he's never he's he's not one to study the door and figure out if there's anything behind it. He's just confidently swinging wide open. Right. So so you, you pull it, it, you have to just shove it like it was your intended plan all along. And in front of you is Alistair McGuffin, who's smiling to himself in a kind of weird, creepy way. No. Ah. Alistair, yeah. I, you're a science person. You might know. And then I look you know, left and right. Clearly, we're in a small corridor, but I look left and right anyway to see if anyone's overhearing this admission that I might not know everything. <laughs> Lean in close. What's a flange? Oh, uh... It is actually uh, gone. It was just here a minute ago. But clearly, you are a person that net, uh, that isn't I. Great. <laughs> so, it seems we found a secret layer of sorts. Yes, I... Uh, that's a tree. Quite. This is quite clever, really. It's, it's, it's a jungle out there, and oh, so you got my message? No. Cut to a sparrow uh, in the ocean, sparks flying out of it as the as the paper floats off into the distance. Cut back. There was. Was this a thing that you made? Carefully produced, yes. You might need to go back to the drawing board because I did not receive a message. What I received was a tree. Hmm. Yeah, sure. They have roots. They are much more stable than a sparrow. Maybe I should branch out into that area soon. <laughs> Almost tight. Max doesn't look at the camera, like doesn't turn his head to look at the camera, but his eyes definitely flick directly to face the camera. <laughs> I'm sorry. And we're gonna cut there. Um uh I, I don't I hate to do this, but I keep giving you rewrites because that was good. Um yeah, so you get the four for the pun. Um we're back to the casino, uh, where uh, uh Nora and Gabriel have reunited after the Soul searching, heart rending song that Nora is totally capable of doing and it's completely consistent with her character. Gabe will stand at the side, clapping for a moment, like literally proud of how she's pulling the lights towards her, like the true star that she is at the moment. And, and she'll do the thank you. I'm sure you're. Uh... Normal entertainment will be back soon and kind of put the, you know, microphone up and step off and like, and look, Lots look of applause. at Gabe. <laughs> and, and keep going. <laughs> Just <laughs> stares for a minute. And he'll return with a big smile. Like, this was all planned. This was just... <sighs> well, old machine. <laughs> and before... Um, going meeting up with Gabe in any way she's going to kind of just mull around the crowd to see if you know and make little chit chat oh thank you I hope you're having a good time you know that kind of thing yeah and, and everyone's like you know they they uh want your autograph um they a couple uh, of uh men and a couple of women uh act like they know you just like oh yeah we met so to try to you know um chat you up a bit uh but um Pretty quickly, uh, one of the uh, staff of the casino comes over and says, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, Mr. Petragio would like to have you join him at the blackjack table. Oh, well, of course. I uh, I hope I wasn't too forward, but you can never uh, miss a networking opportunity. I'm sure that's true, ma'am. You come this mm -hmm. way, please. Kind of like quick glance over the shoulder at Gabe and then continues on to the blackjack table. <laughs> Uh, what's Gabe doing while, while this is happening? He'll uh, watch everything that's happening and then seeing her being whisked away. He'll just casually saunter following her. 
Okay. Uh, uh, so you're gonna make it, the make backgrounds. It, Making a quick stop to order another rum coke minus the coke, and then follow okay. her again. Okay. Um, so you're not gonna you're just gonna kind of like stay with the rest of the crowd, keep an eye on things, but you're not gonna be visible. He'll, he'll make his way so that Nora will know that he's around. Mm -hmm. Um once uh they arrive at the blackjack table. Is there a room? Uh so the blackjack table actually is kind of in the middle of the crowd. Um mm -hmm. Uh, all the tables are kind of scattered on this large open area, uh, and uh, a lot of the people who were watching it have sort of milled over to uh, the black cat table. So there's lots of people around that you can easily kind of stand in the crowd and see. And also you can find a good spot that – so you're opposite Norris and Nora can see that you're there, um, and you can kind of do eye contact communication if you need to, uh, but you won't be like sitting at the table or anything like that. But is there room at the table? to? to there actually is a seat open if you want to just sit down. Oh, yeah. He's definitely okay. going to sit down. Um, uh, then, uh, <laughs> at, as, uh, Nora comes up, um, like I said, the, the black table is huge. Um, there's, uh, room for six people. Uh, there was an empty seat. It's no longer true. Uh, the, one of the persons at the far end, uh, you've recognized immediately because his image is plastered literally everywhere on the island, uh, is, uh, Petrazzo. And he, uh, stands up as you walk over and he goes, that was a lovely performance, Miss, uh, you can call me Cardelia, Mr. Petraza. And Ms. kind Cardelia. of offers, offers her hand. <laughs> and uh, he uh, takes it and um, he kisses it and it's just way too much saliva for this moment. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> the right, and you're like... You, it, back your head, you're like, don't wipe it off, don't wipe it off, don't wipe yeah, it off. <laughs> kind of does the thing where you like fold one hand over the other. Oh, well done. Of, you know? Well um, done. I hope you liked it. I can never stand to see a fellow singer uh, struggle, and I just wanted to smooth it over as quickly as possible for her. He kind of snorts and is like, ah, Josephine, she's not been on her game the past few months. I, I don't know what's wrong with her, but, you know, uh, when you love someone, you overlook their, their flaws, as it were. Oh, is, um, are you and Josephine... Sorry, nothing serious know. nothing serious don't worry about it uh seems lovely uh i'm sure she is but come i want you to to uh enjoy the game uh if there's anything you need uh, uh drinks uh steak at the table just let me know and i'll make sure to arrange it for you sure i i think i'd rather just watch and well i guess it's a game of cards so i can't offer to blow on your dice for good luck he uh smirks at the the use of the word blow and kind of just sits back down <laughs> and she'll, she'll just have a she'll like um ask someone to pass a chair and we'll just kind of sit down next to okay him. do the whole you know so he sits down big smile on his face turns over sees someone he has no idea who they are and immediately a smile disappears it's like and who are you oh i'm the new, uh player you look like you were one person short oh well I hope you can make an interesting Mr. Uh, Reyes. Mr. Reyes. Nice to meet you. Um, so the buy-in is uh, $500. I hope you're able to cover that. Easily. All right. Then um, uh, one of the staff people come over and they uh, give you some a stack of the, kind of those, those big, thick uh, lucite chips and sets down in front of you. Uh, the writers forget to write the scene about where you actually hand over money because they don't know how that works. Never been to a casino before. Uh, and you start to play. So, what is Reyes's goal during this blackjack scene? Because the actual rules of blackjack don't mean a damn for this episode. <laughs> it's more what you're trying to accomplish here. Uh... I mean, <clears throat> twofold count one kind of trying to get his face out to uh, Petrazzo. Okay. That he is there. Like, okay. kind of for preempting that he's going to be the final face that Petrazzo will see before his plans are being foiled. Um, uh, I see. Okay. And the other is just having a good time. So, this is kind of. Early Casino Royale, where it's yeah. just kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm the person who's going to face you down, make sure you remember this face, kind of. Yeah. Polite arrogance. Yeah. Got it. 
Okay. Uh, let's call that. Um, it's definitely presence. And uh, either enigmas, if you're trying to just play blood or better blackjack, or persuasion, if you're really heavily relying on bluffing. Uh, I'll go for persuasion. Okay. Uh, and I will roll for him for his blackjack skills. Set the difficulty. Difficulty is three. He's a pretty good blackjack player. I got one success. Okay. Um, you do have some uh, rewrites left if you want to add more dice or just uh, bow out graciously. No, I'm going to rewrite uh... Uh, rewrite it. Um, basically, he's getting lucky with all the cards that he gets. Uh, every time that he just looks like he's down, it's the, the 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 cards after that just fall for him, and he'll joke about it. He'll be like, "Oh, I just must have one of those moments, one of those days. Luck, Lady Luck shines," and he'll wink towards Cordelia. She must be the bringer of luck today, like. On the right time for the singing, on the right time for making me all this money. Uh, I I'll tell you what, we can do a couple of ways. Um, if you want to do it for free, you can say that you, you have a gadget up your sleeve that actually allows you to, you know, uh, swap cards out and just cheat. Uh, and if that if that happens, you will get close to the end, but you will still lose. You can spend a rewrite to actually have the cards fall in your favor, which means you'll come down to a face down. Then we'll do another dice roll to see what the result of that is. Or you can spend two rewrites to just flat out win the game and make Petrazzo look bad. Can I use the rewrite? Because I kind of want to set it up for a trademark um, to that he has the gadget, that the cards at times fall in his right place, and that at the end it's like noticeable that there is kind of cheating going on. Oh, so you want, you want Petrazzo to see you cheating? Yeah, for, for the end game, where it's literally the two of them, and then just the cards then just fall badly at times. And it's, it can, I'm kind of trying to set it up for one of my trademarks. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Um, well, let's, let's do that then. Uh, so um, you have a little uh, uh, metal arm under your, uh, uh, so and it's actually it's it's very clever. Um, what it does is it actually loads blank cards into your card, um, and so you tap out on your palm a certain sequence that actually prints up the cards you need and shoots it into your hand. Uh, so um, you actually start to control the game pretty strongly, uh, and knock the other players out. Uh, you now we have two big stacks of chips, one in front of Petrazzo, one in front of you, uh, and you're getting ready to. Uh, Flip over the cards. What, what trademark are you setting up for? So make sure I set the scene right. Uh, basically, if you're not cheating, are you really trying? Right. Okay. Um, so you uh, put your hand down and um, the, the the printer on your arm has run out of ink. So you flip up four cards and one blank card. And he'll just look confidently at Petraza. Like at that moment, not knowing that it happened. And he'll just be like, I've got this. And, and Petraza's like, Wait a minute. Are you cheating in my casino? He'll look down. I mean, are you even, are you, if you're not cheating, are you even trying? Okay. Make a uh, persuasion and presence roll to see if you could just unnerve him. Persuasion and presence. At, at this point, I don't know if this will aid at all, but oh. I, I think Nora will uh, go, oh, and kind of lean in to whisper to Petrazzo. I think he's a famous patron. He's supported multiple of the uh, of the opera houses that my parents, that my mother performs at. Okay, Just then, kind of very quietly, like to him, as if it's a secret. <laughs> yeah, what we'll do is, Edwin, don't tell me what you got yet. Hold on to your dice roll. Um, CJ, go ahead and roll uh, persuasion and manipulation. Okay. Your successes will add as enhancement to Edwin's roll. Nice. I got, th I got three successes. Okay. I have a pretty good manipulation, so let's hope. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have said that because I'm pretty sure I just jinxed <laughs> myself. But... <laughs> okay. Uh, five successes. 
Yow. Okay. <laughs> So you, uh, difficulty was uh, two, so that's three successes. To, uh, those convert all two enhancements to your roll, which means you had six hits. Uh, difficulty was three, so you easily uh, convince him to not be angry. Um, and then uh, is there something else you want to do with your extra hits, or do you want me to just – I have an idea, but I want to make sure you guys are using your hits the way you want to first. Yeah, for for Nora, I'd like to go with whatever your idea is. She's okay. just trying to like slide that in there to make the conversation. Okay. I kind of want to have uh, as of one of the additional hits. Uh, one of mm -hmm. the, card, the the blank cards have the uh, signature of AMG on it. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, so it was like. <laughs> Tom. Yeah. <laughs> Tom <laughs> knows where I'm going. Tom knows where I'm going. Uh. So he he. For a moment, gets uh, you see like you know fury past his face, like like he's gonna leap over that table, uh, and then uh, Nora whispers in his ear, and he calms down. Then eventually, he's, he smiles, and it's like you know what, I like you. You walk in here, you sit down at my table. You got you got guts. I appreciate that. You know what? How about both of you come to my mansion tonight for dinner? I like Be that. honored. Excellent, excellent. He gets up, um, uh, point, points at one of the staff, you, take my chips. Go deal with it. And they rush over and grab Esper Petrazzo, start scraping the chips up. And he goes, I'll see you tonight. And then walks off. Bye. Oh, be before you go, here, have this card. And he'll hand them the blank card with AMG on it. He looks at it, a little confused, and kind of just tucks it in his pocket and goes, yeah, thanks, appreciate it. Nice little memento of our, of our moment together. Yeah, absolutely. And they walk off. Nora will stand up and kind of like straighten herself out and just wink at Gabe. Uh, but like she's 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 got this cover story of a very like flirty sort of so right. like, nobody will nobody will think about it and just kind of disperse okay. herself into the crowd. So uh, cut to a commercial break. Um, you watch some some great commercials about uh, the breakfast cereal and. Uh, Cigarettes. Cigarettes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Cigarettes. 60s, right? So, yeah, cigarettes, how healthy they are. Um, and we make our way back, and uh, we're now at the mansion. Uh, the mansion, it's, it's actually on a hill not too far from the resort, but it's isolated enough for privacy, particularly because there are some a lot of guards walking around the mansion uh, with uh, Uzis. Uh, so, they're, they're clearly very serious about security, but not serious enough to get a real automatic weapon. Uh, and uh, the mansion itself is, again, kind of ancient Greek theme, lots of uh, traditional columns, lots of white marble, uh, clearly put together by someone who's maybe read a book about ancient Greece once, was really into it. Uh, the inside of the manor is very, lots of, white marble lots of gold probably way too much of both uh someone who has more more uh, money than taste and uh lots of paintings again of petrazzo's face uh some marble statues of petrazzo with a physique that is very unlikely uh and you are all di competently directed to the table um because we had a commercial break, you've had a chance to uh, change your costume. So if you want to describe what you're wearing now for this dinner, uh, we'll start with uh, CJ. Yeah, I think, um, you know, go in with, I think I'm going to go mod, right? Okay. okay. So <laughs> it's the uh, sleeveless, um, tight, black, uh, short, like almost a mini skirt and high mm. boots. Oh, nice. Uh, got but i'm thinking more farrah fawcett hair than mod hair it's got the flip out and um you know it's a little sparkly it's got some sequin to it it's uh i don't know who made this uh but one of the, the person who is simultaneously the only costume department person and prop person on the entire <laughs> production just had fun one day but right. you know it works uh <laughs> and got like um some sort of Layery necklace that's not too heavy because it's still got to go with the mod theme. 
Yeah, that makes sense. You, you got the costume designer who luckily wasn't on uh, robotic sparrow duty, and so they, were, they had a chance to actually get some stuff done. Uh, <laughs> that, Edwin. It was in my uh, contract. <laughs> right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, tuxedo um, in the side pocket is a uh, silver casing with uh, cigarettes in it because we just had the uh, cigarette uh, um, advert. So, of course, we need to make sure that those are showcasing uh, there as well. Um <laughs> Shiny shoes, just a typical stylish spy. Awesome. Uh, Ryan. On mute. Um, I imagine that Max's costume department is like rack upon rack of suits that are easily destroyed mm -hmm. just because he fights a lot. Um, and, and so it's, it's a really low quality suit it just looks cheap because it's the, oh, like the sleeves are designed to rip off mm. um and the only only uh personalization to it is that his cufflinks and maybe his tie pin if he's if if, if the situation calls for it uh are um uh, not monogrammed uh, but they have the they have the logo of the fraternity that sponsors him in his cover uh, mm. uh is like, like a hey remember cover identity does extend to the spy job sometimes and right and, and, and i'm assuming based on the work you did before it's like you've sourced like the exact uh cufflinks that were given to that graduating class of the year from your particular cover and so you managed to find those exact ones and put those on yeah it's uh, it's, it's it's one of the rare professional displays of professionalism that max ever exhibits and it's entirely useless <laughs> But damn it, he knows. But still with enough flair that he stands out. <laughs> and Tom. Yeah, um, there is a deleted scene that didn't make it into the final cut where um, Alistair went to Nora and asked for dressing advice. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> I the 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 fans have gotten a hold of the deleted scene and posted right. it on the forums. They've talked a lot about it. Yeah, it, it, it's on the 50th anniversary DVD release of the show. Um, so they they managed to put it in the extras. <laughs> the shivers so, went wild, you know. <laughs> nice. So he is actually wearing something nice. The lab coat went away, and he is like. I think it's uh like it says academia, but on a special occasion, like many brown tones and and so I, I'm sure he has like elbow patches. Yeah, yes. the, the polished elbow patches, <laughs> not the yes. ones. <laughs> and a much nicer bow tie. Right. Right. Uh, I'm imagining a, a slightly jazzed up version like the eleventh doctor. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you're all you all come in your finery. Uh, the camera uh, uh, lingers in each of you, so they can uh, take in all of the uh, expense that was not spared for the prop department and the costume department. Uh, and uh, you walk up through uh, the, the kind of the big foyer area, uh, and a guards directs you through a door to go um, kind of past the large staircase leading up. And the guard says, stay here a moment. And there's a, a loudspeaker over the door. And uh, the loudspeaker says, state your name. Um, hi, uh, <laughs> it's Cardelia Lorena, the opera singer. You may pass. Gabriel Reyes, you know, the one you couldn't beat, or the one that you beat, did beat at the card table. This unit does not play cards. Please restate <laughs> statement. Gabriel Reyes, inv invitation by Mr. Petraza. You may pass. And he'll walk in. State your name. Uh <clears throat> Alistair McGuffin, a uh, world-famous robot expert and scientist. I am impressed by your intelligence. 
please define world famous. And they pass. <laughs> <laughs> State your name. Okay, so we get like dramatic zoom of Max and then cut away to that conspiracy board. And yeah. then one of those really cheesy sound like pop sound effects as all of the text is removed from it. <laughs> um, um uh, Max profits of the, the United U European Embassy. Please restate name. Max Profits. You may pass. I swagger into the room. Uh, he, as you as you as you swagger in, the guards kind of just like rolling his eyes and then shaking his head at, at this. Uh, and you make your way into uh, the dining room, and it's it's a lot. So on the one hand, it's uh, a large room, uh, lots of uh, again um, gold and. Uh, white marble. There's lots of rugs on the grounds. A long table. It's about 16 people. A nice, beautiful hardwood table. Uh, lots of ornate carvings on the legs and long edge, which does not match at all the decor of the rest of the house. It's literally someone said, hey, that thing's old. You should buy it. And he did. Uh, and the whole table is uh, covered with um, there are place settings for each person. And there's little name plates, but like half the name plates are blank because they didn't know who your names were. So he's going to put plates down just to make sure that everyone's reserved, but there's no names on them. Uh, but that's just one half of the room. Then the other half of the room is uh, just glass. It's just lots of, of glass walls and a, a large glass door that opens up to a pool area, uh, a massive, almost Olympic sized pool. Um, and there are people uh, lounging around the pool, um, some in bikinis or swimwear. Uh, it's early evening, uh, but you have a, one room of people who are dressed in nice finery, having a really nice, luxurious meal, staring at people hanging out at a pool. Uh, and at the end of the table, perhaps inevitably, uh, is uh, Petrazzo sitting there looking very smart, very grand, very full of himself. All the way at the other end of the table, you see uh, Josephine, who is put on kind of a polite smile. She's wearing a nice uh, black dress, very high up in the neck, um, short sleeves. Uh, and she's, she's being polite and civil, but clearly um, not uh, uh, enjoying this nearly as much as Petrazzo is. So before we sit down, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, the blank cards, where are they roughly located? Uh, there's, uh, they're mostly in the middle. Um, it looks like uh, near the ends, uh, there's um, uh, obviously uh, uh, Nora's cover identity is one right next to Petrazzo, of course. Uh, and on the, uh, and your your name is on the other one. So, so your two are right next to Petrazzo. At the other end, uh, there's one for a, uh, let's say, a U.S. senator that you don't recognize the name for, uh, and his wife he sits across from her, and then everyone that's in the middle kind of just are blank names. So I kind of want to use a rewrite. Okay. We I want to have uh, Max seated next to the U.S. senator. Okay. Nora stays where she is. Is, mm -hmm. Marle is, is Marlene's uh, name on the table is in, on the cards as well? Uh. Marlene, I'm blank. Oh yeah, uh, no, she's not. Uh, wait, double checking. No, her name is not on the, on the table. If if not, you can add it if you want. Yeah, if not, okay. her name to be added as well. Okay. Sitting up across her is going to be Alistair. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be seated next to Josephine. Okay. So that we all are all of a sudden with a plus one and uh, kind of fitting for our roles, because. The initial thought process from the um, producers was to do it like this until somebody said, but it makes more sense to have them fit their roles. Right, right, right. Um, uh, so that's pretty much the whole party. Uh, with the addition of next to Marlene, uh, there's another nameplate that says uh, Dieter, uh, but the chair is empty.
So everyone sits at their tables um, uh, uh, and sits at their appropriate roles. And Petrazzo says, you know, welcome to dinner with me. And I'm sure you're all very appreciative of having dinner with a man like myself. And I, I, I hope you enjoy the dinner that I have provided for you. And then turns around and yells to one of the staffers, like, bring out the food! And they skitter off. Uh, so, uh, I would like to, to figure out the kind of social dynamics of what's happening here. Um, I'm going to ask each of you, we're going to kind of skip over a lot of the, the, the conversation portion of it, the early kind of getting to know you, uh, um, you know, small talk part. Basically, I'm trying to figure, ask you what your goal for this dinner is on a social level. And then we'll figure out the appropriate roles each person is going to make to figure out kind of what the social dynamics of the situation is. Um, so we're actually going to start with uh, uh, Ryan, who probably has the least invested in the scene and work our way around. Yeah, no, Max's, Max's goal is just to get through it without blowing his cover in any way, shape or form. That's his, he's like, he's not gonna be rude. He's trying to be as polite and as charming and suave as Jon Barnes would be. Mm -hmm. But it's that, that clash of that's just not who Max is at all. So he, he's, he's trying to convey that he knows which fork to use during which course. And he has a grasp of politics, but it's not terribly well informed so he okay. pro probably makes a couple of conversational faux pas uh, with with the senator but uh, let's call that uh culture and composure okay uh, sorry. um difficulty is one because you're just trying to get through it and then what we're gonna do is any extra successes you get we're gonna put those into a pool that will then spend to get information yep uh one culture and two composure this is gonna go fantastic i'm just checking my trademarks Mm -hmm. See if um, I have yeah. anything for this. And I will say because I'm skipping over the actual role play, if there's a quip that you feel like you could slide into your um, dynamic, let me know, and I'll we'll quickly role play that out to give you a chance to put that in. Well, actually, because so this is entirely with your say so obviously Eddie, but one of my mm -hmm. quips is I've called you here to distract you from my colleagues. So as Max knows, he's not he's probably going to fumble. He's trying to fumble in the most okay. convincing way possible, and hopefully distract everyone from. You distract the, the table from everyone else. Sure, yeah, add a die. Go for it. Love it. Uh, that is two hits. Okay, so you have one extra hit. I'll keep track of that. Uh, and you manage to not make a complete ass of yourself and appropriately distract uh, everyone else at the table at, an, at a key moment during the scene. We'll figure out what the key moment is in a moment. Uh, work our way next to Tom. What is your character trying to do in this scene? Tom? No. Sorry. <laughs> right. Uh, it's probably also Alison who is is trying to get somewhere in the, the situation and he's completely overwhelmed. Like, yeah. oh no, real social setting. I'm <laughs> surrounded by not nerds. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, and then uh yeah, he's I'm trying to uh, to get uh, Marlene to talk about her project, and I'm very bad at talking non-technical stuff. And if I can't fill in a form to receive information, I yeah. So, uh, yeah, I I try to probably impress her by telling her about uh, all these nice inventions that I've done in the past and try so the the goal of the player is to getting her to open up about her research yes and and bring her to trying to trump his successes with hers okay so like... um so what I'll say is this it's going to be uh either science or technology Plus presence, because you're trying to impress her. Uh, difficulty is one. You have one complication of I shouldn't have said that, which is that if you don't buy out the complication, you accidentally blurt out uh, part of your mission statement. Mm hmm. Um. Um. 
so I am I'm letting just slide in there that um, basically I I'm using this in all of my inventions. Everything can be made better with lasers. Everything. <laughs> Okay, uh, that gives you an extra die. I think it's the first time you've used that in a roll. Yes. So. And I used it second time in the show, but it's the first time for the roll. Yep. So it's plus one die. Yes. So presence. And yes, there and are three rewrites. Presence and technology. Uh, and one die. And this is where the mission goes wrong. No successes? No successes. Are once a thing? No, once not to subtract, no. Okay. Okay. So it's not an automatic botch no, like it, another storyteller game. Um so uh Okay, we'll get back to that. Uh Edwin, uh what is your goal for this dinner? You're muted, I think. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so um, as a super spy, and in, in today's episode, there are literally two super spies. One is Nora, the other is uh, Gabriel. Right. Um, the super spy always gets the girlfriend of the bad guy mm -hmm. to swap sides. Yep. So that's what's going to happen here as well. He is literally going to, considering that he already made the first approach, he already kind of got her to open up. He's going to mm -hmm. try to get her to open up a bit more okay, and get her to swap sides to uh, see the, the right things that Under does and all the bad things that the Petravo does and uh, hand, have him have her hand the team uh, the keys to Petravo's, uh, Petravo's uh, downfall. Because okay. I'm a spy. You are a spy. Uh, that is definitely uh, persuasion and manipulation. Um. Difficulty is two, but you have plus one because their attitude's already been increased towards you. So that gives mm -hmm. you a plus one enhancement. Yep. Uh, there's also uh, one complication of in my own house, which means if you don't buy it off, Petrazzo sees you obviously flirting with his girlfriends. Yeah, but once more, what can I say? I'm a spy. Right. <laughs> you may choose not. You can choose not to buy it off. You know, if you swap, that's you can just. Oh no. <laughs> uh, that's uh, four successes. Okay. Uh, so you buy a complication yep. and get an additional hit. Uh, so two for, two and one so far. It's down to Nora. All right. Well, if there's one thing that um, as a uh, woman in a 60s spy fi Nora is good at, it's blowing smoke up a dude's ass. So <laughs> she's trying to do that. Um, she's trying to make him feel like he wants to show off to mm -hmm. her uh, and that hopefully he'll let slip some key information either over dinner or after your dinner drinks or whatever that she's kind of just wow that's so impressive and and he, you've supported this all yourself oh, you're my hero you know love <laughs> so it love it absolutely uh, just laying it on doing the I'm I'm just a flirty, silly little opera singer. Right, like flirty, that. not promising anything, but implying a whole lot. Yeah, like I said, uh, she's good at that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, persuasion, manipulation. <laughs> um, That's what I'm good at. Difficulty is to uh, again one complication of in my own house to see if Marlene or not Marlene, uh, if uh, Josephine notices you flirting with her boyfriend. Absolutely fine. Right at the same table. <laughs> Yeah, this is this is getting dicey, guys. It's <laughs> dicey. Uh, that was unintentional, but I had to lean into it. No, you, you had to lean into it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, got a ten. Oh, I've got two tens. Goodness gracious. Oh, good. Uh, all right, five successes. I only had one success outside of the two tens, but two tens. <laughs> so. Wow. Okay. I'm assuming a buy off the complication. Yes. Yeah. I think. Um, she doesn't really want to she's trying to be a little bit tactical because she really doesn't want to antagonize uh, josephine she has no reason to right it's not so tactically important to do so yeah so this is how this breaks down um so first uh we we start with max who's just really trying to uh get through this dinner without things going wrong and and, and the senator and his wife keep asking parts of his backstory and, and thankfully the 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 
conspiracy board pops back into his head at key moments and so he's able to kind of lay the information there's a awkward moment where the senator is part of the same fraternity uh but luckily you had the correct uh cufflinks on and so he immediately recognizes them and that leads into your cover story which is good because uh mcguffin is talking to marlene and starts getting really excited about his research and then starts immediately saying, and and that's how I started using that when I started building things for under, and they've been really appreciative of all of the technology. And so at that point in time, Max kind of jumps on that grenade, spending his extra hit and coughs really loudly about how the drink went down the wrong way as he nudges MacGuffin to get him back on track. So, so the two of you managed to work your way through that situation, but MacGuffin does get some solid information. Uh, finds out that uh, Marlene uh, is the daughter of Dr. Kiefer, uh, who died while working with Petrazzo. And that Petrazzo is the person who's investing in Marlene and her brother Dieter's research into robotics. And they are researching somewhere on the island, but that's when the conversation went the wrong direction. So you didn't get much more than that. Uh, and then we have the two ends where you should tell the fact that both spies are openly flirting with both of them right in front of each other. Uh, and just the amount of successes you get. Um, uh, but the, the key information you get from both sides is that uh, Petrazzo and uh, Josephine are clearly not happy in their respective relationships. Um, the, 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 if that wasn't clear before, it's super clear now. Uh, but it's not quite the way you think it is. Um, uh, Josephine feels like Petrazzo is so wrapped up in his work that he's not paying attention to her anymore. Uh, and so she's been getting more distant because she feels like the only way she gets attention is through her singing. Uh, so he has thought, he's not he's not getting jealous of her because men are paying attention to her. It's more the fact that he's so wrapped up in whatever plan he has that he has kind of taken her for granted. Uh, so it, it, it's 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 a sad moment where like if you actually got these two in a room, maybe had a conversation, they probably could get through it. Maybe with some couples counseling, a little bit of therapy. Uh, but it's the sixties, so we don't do those kinds of things. Uh, so um, the fact that Gabe is just so supportive and uh, uh, attentive to her, um, she is starting to fall a little for him, and she feels guilty about that. And, and Gabe's been in these situations enough he knows how to play people and so he's walking a fine line to keep her on the hook but not you know emotionally crush her uh and so it's the you know being supportive being attentive the friend who wants to listen to you but then carefully quietly putting up roadblocks whenever it seems like it's going towards you know i could i could be in love with you uh whereas on the other end um is just so excited about being impressive uh and he drops little things. He's very careful about what he says. He, he's he's a clever man. He knows kind of how to place things, and he is paying attention to uh, what's going on at the other end of the table and vice versa. But again, not jealous so much as kind of just, are you okay? Checking in. Uh, but in the because it's paying attention to uh, Nora and paying attention to uh, Josephine and paying attention to that weird coughing fit that was happening at the end of the table. Uh, he does let slip that uh, one of the things his company is trying to do is he's really heavily invested in robotics and that he's hoping that uh, the people who are coming to this party will uh, help to further invest in his long-term plans. What those long-term plans are, he kind of realizes where he's going and quietly deflects the conversation. Uh, but certainly he's got some plans involving robotics. Yeah, she's going to definitely lean into that and be like, Wow, I I always thought robots were fascinating. Um, I don't know how much I can do, but I can try and help you convince these people. Can I see your robots? Like, you know, she's just yeah. really... Point that direction, totally. And, and, and I'm assuming that uh, uh, Gabe is somewhere is like going, hey, maybe if you guys show me where, you know, what's going on. I mean, uh, he, got, he, got, he got the key from her as well earlier. Right, so. right, right. Uh, so so that that's kind of how that all is, is, is it's like together. Um, so while you're both playing at the table, at the middle of the table, um, the, the last uh, hit, uh, Max notices something weird because Max is hyper aware of everything going on because he's trying very carefully not to, to blow this. 
Um, and so he's really paying attention to everything, including, and, and he said opposite the, the glass wall. So he keeps kind of staring off into space when he's thinking of his lines uh, and staring at the pool. And he notices something. All those people are lounging around the pool and they're chatting and they're joking and they're, they're uh, uh, having a good time. None of them go into the pool. None of them drink anything. And in fact, at one point in time, you're convinced that one of the women who's making the rounds around the pool says the exact same joke three times. I, I, I assume it's also safe to assume, uh, fair to assume that none of them look like they've been in the pool either. No, no, they're all perfectly dry. Um, sorry, I'm so used to playing subtle characters because that's what the, well, the the groups I regularly play with need. I'm like, what is <laughs> what is the non subtle response here? It's just, it's take me a moment. Um, yeah, I I guess I'd wait for a break in the conversation mm. as, as I realize this. Uh, and then turn, uh, like make make a polite, um, just excuse me for a moment for, to the senator and, and his wife mm. after answering their questions, and um, just turn to MacGuffin the conversation that's going on over there, and notice for the first time who his conversational partner is. Uh, did did you find your flange? I did. Thank you. Um, I, I was able to get it, and that was really great. Fantastic. And then, like, just looking straight at MacGuffin, I thought I saw something that might have been a flange by the pool, but I wasn't <laughs> sure if it was in a safe place there or dangerous. Uh, Tom, I can make, I can give you a roll to see if you recognize the code, or you can, I'll give you a rewrite if you're just like, I have no idea what he just said. <laughs> um, I don't get it. I okay. <laughs> I am I'm in the tunnel vision. This is like the complete opposite to Max. Like I I just fucked up majorly and, and I just <laughs> just talk strictly technical stuff that she did, not I. <laughs> um yeah. So um there are many pools. I suppose, yes, and there have been many accidents. That one, and you know, I, I carefully gesture, I, and then almost <laughs> knock over my my flute or whatever we're drinking. Uh, stop myself just in time from making a huge faux pas. Uh, that one in particular looks very inviting. It's a shame that nobody is in it. Well, and I I pick up my uh, pocket watch, have a look at the time. I'm not surprised at this hour. <laughs> At that point in time, uh, there's a there's a bell. Um, you've all been eating. By the way, it's, it's it was a, a a lovely dinner of, of something that craft services could afford for the scene. Uh, um, but it's now time for uh, coffee and brandy. Um, and so everyone kind of gets up and starts to mill around, which means that everyone's kind of chatting with each other. Uh, so at this point, you could. I don't know, go somewhere as a group. That seems strange. Or uh, you can break up and, and go on your separate kind of uh, submissions to see where you're going. Like, I, it seems like there's a, a pretty strong, let's go check out the pool group. There's a pretty strong, let's go see what Josephine wants to do with this key option. <laughs> I don't, I mean, why would we break with convention at this point? <laughs> You know, I could have prevented a good amount of this by giving us cover stories that interlinked. <laughs> <laughs> if only you had a master spy that actually, like, you know, went on his mission instead of dumping this in your lap. <laughs> well, we've got two master spies now. True. <laughs> we've got, we brought the whole team this time. So, I right. mean, four is better than one, right? You're doing so great so far. Two master spies. It's just a shame they're on the same team. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you know, we're all just buried under Barnes' star power. <laughs> yep. Sure, that that's what's happening, right? You can see, you can see which actors got the good contracts in this show. <laughs> uh, but how, how obvious? So, 
Um, from, kind of from glancing, how obvious is it that uh, McAllister and Marlene have been chatting shop about robotics and stuff like that? Um, really obvious because they're both talking very excitedly about something, and you you understand like one word in five, so you're pretty sure it's probably science stuff. Is there a moment that um, Gabe can have a brief, uh, expand a few words with McAllister? Sure. <laughs> McCuffin. Uh, McC <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, Alistair. I heard what you meant, not what you said. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and I didn't even realize it. I don't until uh, it was just being pointed out. So, Alistair. You know that little trinket you crafted for 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 Barnes for the cheating with the cards and stuff like that. Yes, how could I ever forget about this? Well, I have to say it works well, but it ran out of ink. So if you want to get hired and get access to the secret layer, have a chat with the Travo and uh, tell him about it. Huh. And I'm pre primarily listening to uh, the part of it run out of ink. <laughs> <laughs> uh, huh. That might become a problem later on. It gets kind of unstable at this point. I, I, you did read the, the instructions on it, right? Not to overuse it. Um, I did read how it works. Well, actually, I figured that out very, very quickly. And after that, I put it aside because, hey, it works. It's you not... know how people normally read, read manuals? Read the first important page and after that, ignore every, every warning. <laughs> That's, not... <laughs> That's not the reason why they're so long, you know? <laughs> tomato, tomato. But um, serious, have I worked with Petrava and get hired? He seemed impressed by it. And I look over through the grandmaster of schemes. I'm like, <laughs> well, it doesn't look like Petrava stand next to Nora. So I mean, that maybe not too bad. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. And, and, may and maybe, maybe if you need someone to convince me for more, take Max with you, because he. Has the influences. He can be your sponsor. Okay. Um, <laughs> how do I approach this? Uh, While you're thinking of that, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Max, what are you doing with this right now? Uh, seeing Gabe and um, Alistair are in a conversation. Uh, and that, uh, Max has got enough social new to realize that Alistair really wasn't picking up anything that he was trying to explain. Uh, so um, I'm just going to head straight for the pool. Okay. Um, on the way, like I, I, I pass behind like a pot of plant and I come out the other side and somehow I'm just, you know, in appropriate swimming swimwear. I right. clearly prepared for this possible eventuality that there'd be a swimming pool in the mansion house on the, on the tropical island. Caraway suit. Obviously. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then I'll just dive in the water at the end where all of the people are, where, where, mo where the largest number of people are clustered. Okay. I'm trying to make the biggest splash I can. Okay. Uh, so you dive in, um, and the water is very, very cool. Uh, nice and refreshing, uh, especially after the, the warmer day. Um, it is getting towards the evening, so it's it maybe even getting a bit on the chilly side. Uh, and everyone around the pool stares at you. Uh, and not even like in a kind of, what is that person doing kind of way, but like they all like immediately turn and look at you, laser focus. Uh, so I'll, you know, I'll do a couple of laps. Um, this is the gratuitous beefcake shot. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, and and as you're making laps, like basically everyone's really staring at you and moving their heads all in unison as they watch. So I, oh. I, fin 
Sorry. How how obvious is it for those not near a pool? So basically, those mingling inside. Uh, you can make a uh, enigmas and cunning roll to see if you notice it. I would like to do that if that's all right sure. as well. Yeah, I don't have super ton in that, but Ooh, but I did get it. Three successes. No, I'm absolutely oblivious. Sorry, okay. McCall- McGuffin is just taking up all my attention. To be fair, that that's pretty common. Um, uh, but yeah, Nora's... Uh, at this point in time, you've kind of gone into autopilot flirt mode. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, you clearly got this guy on the hook, so you're kind of just like ha- yeah, giggling at the appropriate times, having attention, you kind of just looking around the room, and then you see this happening in the pool area, and it's like, why, why is Max half naked? Why is he swimming? Why is everyone staring at him? Why is it so synchronized? After a moment, I think Nora's going to go with the less subtle approach here, but is going to be like, um, Mr. Petruzzo, and kind of like have him motion for him to come mm-hmm. in closer. Mm-hmm. Are those your robots? Okay. Just <laughs> lampshade that one. Uh, <laughs> um, integrity. Did they take, she'll probably say something like, or did they take something funny? You right. Know? Uh, integrity or persuasion. Okay, persuasion it is. And uh, manipulation. I have no integrity. Uh-huh. Uh, as we uh, have discovered by my methodology of getting information right. out of this man. Uh, but but you do have, um, his attitude is now up to two, actually, because you've been definitely working hard on him. So I have two enhancement on your roll. Okay. Working hard or hardly working. Oop, I dropped one. Uh, including the enhancement, that's five. That's good because you have five difficulty. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> he was pretty suspicious of that, but um, he's so charmed by you and trying to figure out what's going on. He kind of looks around the room that's full of people uh, and then and brushes your hair over your ear and goes, yes, those are my robots. Do you want to see them? Wow. Yes, please. Uh, Amazing. Now, we, uh, cut back to uh, MacGuffin, who's trying to build up the nerve to talk to Petrazzo, and now suddenly Nora and Petrazzo are very, they're talking to each other very quietly, and they're smiling, and now it's suddenly really awkward again. I I had one of the uh, blank playing cards in my hand. Mm-hmm. was about to to go over there. And Gabe will actually nudge him so that if he just pauses, freezes, Gabe will just give him a nudge so that he just stumbles in the uh, personal space of uh, Petrazzo and uh, Nora. So we Ho- are hopefully at the right moment that the words robots and do you want to see them is being uttered. Sure, we'll say that. It's fine. Okay. Um, I am uh, in. Since I, I got the push and I'm closing in, I, I'm in the middle of saying, well, I think you got one of my car. Oh. And I turn around and uh, I I finally realize um, the, the uh, situation that Max is in with all the robots looking at him. Right. I'm cut back to Max. Um... And they're staring and watching him go back and forth and doing laps. Uh, no one's saying anything. No one's laughing anymore. So I, I finished the length that I'm doing. And then um, past episodes have established that Max is a reasonably competent swimmer. But this time I'm, I'm going for like the splashiest exit. Like, I'm not going to get out of the pool completely, but a huge wave rolls over the sides as I pull myself out. Sure. Again, and also, so... I'm assuming like you, you linger a moment as yeah, you pull yeah, over there, pure, so the camera gets a nice good shot. Yeah, yeah. glistening beefcake right there. <laughs> um, and then uh, I'll kind of look around to, to the closest um, uh, uh, fan presenting bot, at least, let's say. Yeah. Um, um, I just wish you have a towel, do you, dear? And like, I'm just, I'm, I'm flexing at this point. I'm just like, right. like leaning on the pool. This is completely unconscious. He's not. I'm not realizing I'm doing it, but right. It's just, 
displaying everything. And, and she pulls away, and she's like, "Let me let me go get your towel real quick," and then just turns and flees. Like like tries to make sure you as you lean forward, she's leading back. And, and in fact, everyone else in the pool is quietly moving away from you because you're dripping water. It wasn't something I said, was it? And then I will repeat the joke that I heard the, um, her do three times in a row as like a, an icebreaker, I guess. <laughs> so we're back inside and you see uh, Max is getting out of the pool and everyone's starting to leave him alone. So so the, the threat of danger seems to have abated. Uh, uh, so you're all around Petrazzo and Patrick's like, we should, we should excuse ourselves from the rest of the dinner party. Definitely. So he's like, let me make my excuses. I'll come back in a few moments. Uh, and he peels himself off, starts to say goodbye to people. And as soon as he peels away, Josephine slides back over to, to Gabe uh, and is like, come on, I want to I show you what I was talking about earlier. You have my undivided attention. Lead the way. Okay. And he'll actually offer his arm to her. Okay. Um, and then uh, she she takes you off. Uh, does anybody else follow him or leave him to his business? And can I also make a use a rewrite for that? That when that happens, that Petrozo is literally staring at the two of them walking away, just for the added subtlety of who is going to be his downfall and why Josephine is part of it as well. Um, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let, make you spend the rewrite. I'll let him say that he notices that, but um, we established earlier that both of you did your job so well that he's not feeling particularly jealous of this. Yeah, okay. uh, but yeah, no, he definitely reckon he clocks you walking off. No problem. You don't have to do a rewrite for that. Uh, is anyone following you or you, you, just you two going off? Nora's got to stay. That would be okay. weird and sus. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so they go off. Uh, a couple moments later, uh, as Nora's kind of mingling, uh, Marlene comes up to uh, McGuffin and goes, I had such a wonderful time talking. Would you mind if I showed you some of the stuff I'm working on? Sure. Okay, let's go. And she takes you off and starts to walk off with you in another direction. Uh, Petrazzo comes back. Uh, and, and, and Ryan informed me of something, so I'm intentionally omitting them for the moment um, because it'd be funny when this happens. Uh, so Nora, Petrazzo comes back to Nora and everyone starts to linger off and he's like, uh, come, my dear, I'd love to show you what I'm working on. Great. I can't wait. Right. <laughs> just kind of, you know, does the like, drapes the arm around the, um, the his arm and just kind mm. of, you know, <laughs> googly eyed, like, oh. You make robots. <laughs> so, that's so interesting. Wow. Right. Uh, so um, first, uh, Josephine takes Gabe over to uh, a, a door. Uh, we start going through some corridors, and there's a nondescript door. She looks around suspiciously, uh, then takes the key uh, or takes the key back from you, opens up the door, uh, and the door opens up into uh, it looks like an elevator. Uh, so it, it, it's it's a pretty normal Monday looking elevator, except for the fact it is a normal uh, wooden door as opposed to like sliding elevator doors. Uh, and she uh, pushes a couple of buttons and the elevator goes down. Uh, meanwhile, MacGuffin and Marlene uh, are taken through a different uh, passageway and she takes him downstairs into uh, what looks like through the kitchens uh, and then past the kitchens into a set of stairs going down to a kind of a basement area and there's a big metal steel door and she taps a code into the steel door which slides open and escorts you uh, through into the corridors beyond. Uh, uh, Nora and Petrazzo, uh, he takes uh, her uh, upstairs, and it looks like for a moment he's going for the bedroom, and you're already planning your exit strategy on that particular front. Uh, but then he actually uh, goes a different direction uh, towards his study, 
and uh, he sits down at his uh, at his massive wooden desk, uh, and, and he's like, "Please have a seat." Um, and motions the chair across for him, and you're like, "Okay." <laughs> Just gotta okay readjusting like <laughs> right. Great, yeah, yeah, absolutely. and they sit down, and uh, he uh, takes uh, a lighter from his desk and flips it open, and the whole desk and chair set starts to shudder and then slowly move down as the elevator takes him down. Oh my gosh! Wow! Like just really playing up the I've never seen anything like this before. Right. Uh, uh, and then um, at that moment, uh, we cut to uh, all three of you walking through three different doors into one giant room. Uh, and then Ryan, do you want to use your trope now? Uh, I will try to let you know when I when I want to use it. If that's okay. okay. All right. Um, and all three of you walk into, uh, it's a, it's a big complex. There are giants, uh, air conditioners, uh, along the wall. The place is very, very warm, even though it's underground. Uh, there are, uh, massive oversized, uh, computer monitors built into the wall. There are banks of computers, lots of flashing lights and switches and tape reels, uh, doing all sorts of beep, 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 stuff. Uh, and um, next to that, there's actually, it looks like a production line, kind of like uh, they use for cars, uh, except for um, what's coming out of them are actually uh, uh, metallic skeletons that are being dipped into some kind of weird viscous polymer. Uh, and they're being come back out and they're dripping. Uh, and that, and it, there's just so much that kind of all happens uh, in the space. You know, take all the information in the space of a moment. So this is clearly some kind of strange robot manufacturing plants built underground to this island base. And then it's the Petrazzo seeing Josephine and going, what are you doing here? And Josephine going, you weren't supposed to be here. And Marlene's going, hey, our friends are here. Uh and all of you are now at the same moment. There's kind of a tense moment of, of what's going to happen next. So what is going to happen next? Oh, my gosh. Wow. Um, so all these people also know about your robots? I try to go, they're not supposed to. Oh. Marlene's like, but you hired me to work on the robots. And he's like, well, obviously, I didn't mean you. I'm talking about the rest of the people. And she's like, points to McGuff. He's like, but he's my friend, and he also works on robots. And I get back the card, the, the, the playing card, and I reuse the strategy from earlier, and I go over to him, <laughs> show it to his face, and say, well... You already might have got my card. And he's like, I don't understand. What? And then Josephine, uh, trying to grab Gabe's arm and step back through the door. And it's like trying to ghost out of this. G Gabe will actually put his arm around her waist and just literally... Instead of letting her pull away, step forward with her. Uh, and so he sees the Petrazzo sees this, and then he looks at the man holding a blank playing card in front of him, and then turns to Nora, and then uh, he starts to pull a gun out from under his coat, and goes, "I don't think you're who are, you say you are." <gasps> oh no! Shocked look. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, I think if, as soon as she sees, is is he obviously including her in this? I yes. Will. Okay. Yes. Yeah, as soon as she sees him. He's go stepping away from her as he pulls the gun, yeah. Reaches up the skirt and grabs her gun from her holster, because that's where it is. Right. And she goes, this isn't going exactly according to plan, which is one of my quips. <laughs> oh, okay. There you go. Uh. Let's go ahead and roll. I have forgotten how initiative works in They Came From. Uh, um, I believe it is. Is it like Scion and the other some of the other story paths where it's um what 
one of the attributes like was it right. dexterity plus uh you know what i was gonna this is this way um uh tell me what uh roll you're gonna make uh, tell me this way for a second so we're kind of dance around there for a second uh but what you're planning to do in this scene and then we'll do initiative roll based on that oh i, I have the systems be. chapter open if that helps oh oh well, better yet okay if you got it already then let's do that what's, uh, what's that it's the lowest of athletics plus cunning or empathy plus dexterity. There okay. we go. That's the same as Scion, yeah. Okay, all right. So say, oh. say that again. Athletics? Plus cunning or empathy plus dexterity, but it's the lower of the two. So in my case, that would be dexterity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Time to shift away. Um, we're rolling uh, initiative uh, because guns have been pulled. Yes. Uh, I, I figure if I roll it, then on my turn, my thing happens. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for for, for pe people who are watching, uh, 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 Ryan is technically in the scene for for dice purposes. Oh, three either way, fantastic. I cannot believe this. I got a three, and I only roll three dice. It's just one of them was a ten. Oh wow! Um, it's uh, cunning. Uh, Tom, it's cunning and athletics, or what was the other one? Uh, empathy or dexterity. Empathy plus dexterity is the lowest yeah, which, of the two. Whichever one's lower. Thank yeah, you for looking one. up, by the way. So three, one. Uh, I have two. Two. Um. I actually got one because uh, I am not an ordinary nerd. Um, Alistair was part of the program for uh, promising young students, and it developed from some sort of um, research camp into something more pharmaceutical. And uh, he, from time to time memories come back and he gets like really fast what what you wouldn't expect so he actually had some dice in that oh okay very well one one success uh okay um so uh each of those is a, a slot player character or non-player character can go uh there is currently one npc slot at three uh player characters go before non-player characters so uh a player character can go first before the non-player character go who would like to take that first slot I mean, since Nora gave the quip, I'm inclined to say she takes it, but it's up to y'all. I'm okay with that if if everyone else Works is. Me. Okay. Yeah, she's gonna obviously draw the gun on um on him and just be like, "I guess the jig is up." My name's not Cardelia, and um, oh gosh, I don't want to just shoot the man. That seems excessive. It is the sixties, you know. The gun, uh, gun pointed at me. Yeah. Sorry. Blam. <laughs> Mission over. <laughs> <laughs> um i think i'm gonna try to convince him to put the gun down so, so she's just gonna be like the jig's up petruzzo put the gun down okay and, um, i guess um, that would be what persuasion and something persuasion and presence because you're not lying anymore okay um difficulty is three okay Let's see how we go. I know that I feel like my luck is bound to run out eventually, but not today. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you get? That is uh, just three. Just three. Yeah, so. Okay. Um, uh, so you say the chick is up. Uh, put a gun at him. He realizes that there's, a, there's something in your eyes that makes him realize that you will pull the trigger. And so he drops the gun and puts his hands up. It's the lack of integrity points, I think. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I will shoot you. I, I After the shit I have to deal with in this team, I will shoot you. Uh, Just need to hell? let off some stress, man. Give me a reason. <laughs> right. Uh, the NPC goes. Um, uh, normally, this would be filled by uh, um, Petrazzo. Uh, however, at this point in time, Josephine pulls her gun and points it at Gabe. And says, drop your weapons or I kill him. We now have a two slot. Who wants to go? 
If it's okay, I'll take it. Yeah, seems like it makes sense narratively. He'll turn to uh, Josephine. Hey, what can I say? I'm a spy, but do you prefer the nine millimeter or the nine iron? <laughs> so that's a quip and a trite mark. Yep. And he'll, pull, and he'll pull uh, pulls his gun. Okay. Uh, that will add uh, two dice to your roll because it's a trade mark. Yep. Are you going to shoot her or are you just trying to face her down? Face her down. Okay. Um, your difficulty is five for reasons you're not entirely clear on yet. Um, so the trademark gives me plus two dice, right? Yep, it does. So uh, manipulation and persuasion, or uh, I'm sorry, yes, uh, same as uh, her roles. So the uh, manipulation, or no, presence of persuasion, uh, because you're not lying to her. You, you, okay. you will shoot her. Um, what does does my quip give any bonuses? Uh, oh, because uh, I used the quip. As the, well. the trademark, the trademark supersedes the quip. Oh, okay. Because quip is you one die, trademark is two dice. It's basically a better quip. Uh, four successes. Yeah, not quite enough. Nope. Um, you said something about her is not willing to back down. Uh, we have two one slots left. Uh, Tom or Ryan, do you, do you want to take this? Uh, Tom, if you want to go, I have chaos in mind. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Two out of three of the women in this room are are willing to shoot a man immediately. <laughs> um, we haven't got to Molly yet. Molly yet? Yeah, she's a zero. Uh, and she's kind of freaking out right now. <laughs> I'm kind of undecided what I wanted. Do you recur? I've got options, um, but I think I think I have to do this. So, um, everyone is uh, everyone is pointing guns at each other, and yes. I not. I don't have a gun. I didn't bring any guns. It's true. I brought large containers with me, and these villains should have known it is a bad idea if somebody brings loads of not really disclaimed containers to their island. So I'm doing this scene now. Once per story, you may brief the entire squad on the equipment they'll be using during the mission. Distribute a weapon or other object helpful to each other. Player spies during the scene. Uh, each other's player spies during the scene. In addition, you carry a mechanism that transforms upon activation into a golden katana, sniper rifle, self-piloting boomerang, or other valuable weapon. <laughs> the director agrees is appropriate. So I am basically going out there, taking the stage, mm. and I say, well, it seems you have uh, um, dramatically underestimated us. Since you didn't know that this man is actually holding, and I am explaining various items on your person as being some sort of secret gadget uh, that you sh may use later on, I don't know. Uh, the important part is that um, I am carrying actually two of the uh, playing card dispensers at this very moment. And they are just shooting playing cards into the air. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> okay. Um, we'll call that a field condition of playing cards everywhere. Uh, which means that it's going to be harder to shoot through that because there's just a, a blur, a uh, flurry of playing cards now throughout the scene. And there's like an improbable amount of cards, like, like hundreds of cards, like no way that many cards could possibly fit up your sleeves. Yes. Yeah. That, that's my action. Ryan, would you like to do something? Okay, so after that stunning display of professionalism from my quartermaster, I assume, um, yes. the uh, the adventure is time to shine. Um, quick, like, camera cut back to the pool. I've got my towel. I've dried off. I'm I'm putting my, uh, my suit back on. And then, um, like, I hear a weird noise from mm -hmm. something in the jungle. And I, I, I kind of dash over to check it out because, like, my allies aren't here anymore. 
there's a conversations I'm eager to avoid. Dear God, get me out of this situation. Uh, but I forgot that I deliberately made the side of the pool as well as I possibly could, and I'm wearing dress shoes. Mm -hmm. And I slide, I slip, and I sl <laughs> I slip face first into a poorly disguised ventilation shaft. Um, <laughs> my trope is called uh, where, where is it? Uh, I I may have just minimized zoom. Oh dear, I hope that hasn't broken anything on stream. Uh, I'm sure it's fine. Uh, something into the fray, yes. Uh, and there's there's a, there's a series of bong, 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 as I bounce through the ventilation system. Um, and as I hit the bottom of the vent in this, this giant underground room, I come tumbling out of it and I slam like back first into a computer bank, sending sparks flying and triggering the sprinklers. And that's how I drastically change the environment as I enter the scene late. Okay, uh, so sprinklers go off. Um... And uh, Josephine starts to short out. She, she's a robot. Uh, Petra Petrazzo <laughs> just gets wet. Uh, Marlene screams at zero <laughs> and rushes towards the computer bank. And I, at first, it's like a half second of like, maybe she's going to check on you and then just shoves you off the computer bank and starts trying to dig through the computer bank debris. I okay did not see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> uh, start at three. Uh, who wants to go? Who wants the player character wants to go first at three? Hmm. Anybody else? Or I'm no? narratively, it makes sense for me to go last because I've just fallen fit, like head first into the scene. Right. So I'm I'm happy to go last for that. So. I kind of want to use a rewrite rule, if possible. Sure. So we all know how um, in uh, what's uh, the one with um, what's his name? Uh, oh, Doctor Evil. Yeah, Doctor Evil. He has this uh, space laser sharks uh, in the pool swimming around. Right. Yep. So somehow the um, production team managed to get their hands on a nice, good-sized pool. For some oblivious reason, they kind of got the space sharks. They managed to put it into this current scene. Petruzzo is standing on one end, mm. and Nora is standing with him with the pistol, mm -hmm. and is in such a position that she can uh, push him into the water with the sharks and the laser sharks. Okay. Um, I will say that uh, 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 Josephine uh, clearly was the actual mastermind. Um, it would be very implausible for her to have a large source of water against the robots that are uh, problematic with water. So I'll say it takes three rewrites to say that there is, in fact, this pool there. Absolutely. Let's do All it. Right. I have a question. How much is Josephine short-circuiting at the moment? Is she still able to fire a gun is my main question. Yeah, I, I didn't uh, want to deus ex max into the scene. Well, uh, if you had a robotics expert to answer that question, he might be able to tell you. <laughs> oh, wait, you do. <laughs> I think instead of going right now, um, Nora, who's still pointing at uh, Petruzzo, says, can someone please handle the robot with the gun? I mean, technically, I haven't. Yeah, no, I mean, we haven't gone yet. I just reshaped the environment. A bit right, right, more, right. So... Yeah, that, 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 that take an action. That was just spending some currency. Yeah. Um, so we still have the, the player character option at three. Um, so if you want to, if someone wants to go to take care of the short circuiting robot now before someone goes to three, you can. That's your cue, uh, Alistair. Yes, that's me. Um, I am putting on my sciency goggles. Um, okay. My glasses. Um, I have visionary inventions i don't think it does anything much for me at the moment it lets me look through uh surfaces mm -hmm. although it might be nice to see the inner workings of the robot i am facing and um, i i i will say that um i'll let you use that to determine her current state and what her likely next actions are yes that was something i loved okay um so basically uh you 
based on the fact that these robots clearly use an A15 flange, um, you, you're able to deduce the entire workings of the entire rest of the robot. Uh, and you realize that uh, because they're susceptible to water, um, she is probably in the process of freezing up. Uh, but one of the downsides of this particular model of uh, robotic supplementation is that their hydraulic muscles tend to contract when they are being uh, electrocuted, um, which means that the finger on the trigger may contract very shortly. Okay. Um, I think I have something for exactly this occasion, and I'm going to do some modifications on it with an A17 flunge, which is definitely superior. But it's so implausibly big. <laughs> That's why it hits harder. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to run over there. And uh, I hope my uh, scientific site is helping me getting it in there and do some rapid modifications on this model. Uh, let's call that technology in might. And I used uh, a quip. Okay. Which quip is that? I have something for exactly this oh, occasion. Okay. Sure. Um, I think it's this. First time you've used that? Yeah, I, okay, just... I used all of them once so far. Plus one die. Um, this is good because I'm pretty shit at this role. <laughs> oh no, wait, it's it's uh, it's it's uh, technology. Yeah, so technology, it's not... but it's might. Yeah, you're you're using your strength to to force a, a hack. One success. Okay. Um, luckily, that's all you needed. Uh, you you bring the flange down uh, and you activate uh, the the reverse function um, so that all the muscles instead of contracting will start to uh, uh, release and she slumps to the ground the gun collapsing to the ground. Yeah, it's a little known fact, but you could have got this if you studied for longer. <laughs> That's why uh, we have you. Um. Marlene uh, will take the three slot uh, as she is uh, messing around with the computer. She's going to try to do a thing. Am I able to use a trope while she's trying to do a thing? What's the trope? Answer to everything. Enemy enterprises underestimate your diverse array of skills in covert operations and mechanical engineering. Once per story, disable or disrupt enemy equipment up to a medium range away, explaining the malfunction as a result of one of your many gadgets or connections. If not, uh, that's what I'm planning to do on my turn anyway, to be quite transparent, but... Uh, well, uh, yeah, it, it's like, you, I feel like you have to take a slot to do that, but um, but we, you get the next slot after hers. That's not a problem. Perfect. Thank you. I can't wait to see um, what she's doing. She has a uh, done thing. Okay. Um, so she starts uh, uh, winding the tape back up on the computer and, and, and putting it on her spindle and, and, and starts spinning it. Uh, and uh, the voice that you heard earlier when you were coming in to be uh, uh, or, uh, going to dinner, um, the, the, that voice kind of spins back up like a tape being wound up and it goes, T minus 30 seconds. Now it's your turn. Yeah, she's going to look at Marlene almost with some empathy. She doesn't, I don't think she even knows Marlene's name because she was, I don't think she was no. ever in the same scene as her, but with some no. empathy and just go, I'm sorry, but I can't let you continue this work. And um, it's going to probably like pull off an earring and like press it down and just something, what I would say is probably something starts smoking inside this computer and it's uh nice it, it's some sort of field or explosive that she managed to plant somehow <laughs> yeah yeah you have uh, um your earring is actually uh one part of a binary uh emp pulse uh and so you actually managed to uh disrupt all of technology in this room uh which is great because that means you shut down the self-destruct sequence that there she was trying to get off i uh, shut all of the robots here and also the robots uh a programming device that allows you that allows uh Petrazzo or Josephine that part's still unclear um to send orders to the robots around the world. Awesome. Uh yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, since we're kind of pretty close to time, I'll just kind of uh do the epilogue of the episode. 
Um, as you are uh, cleaning up, you uh, do interrogation, you find a couple things out. Uh, first off is that uh, Josephine was, in fact, the mastermind behind this all along using Petrazzo as the face towards her um, option, towards her uh, goals of trying to replace people with robots. Uh, because her logic being is that if people are going to treat her like an unfeeling machine, that she might as well put more unfeeling machines into the world to let them know what she what she feels like. Uh, um, you also find uh, a small jail that's underneath these tunnels uh, where all the people that have been replaced by robots are actually kept, uh, including John Barnes. And it turns out John Barnes had been replaced by robots initially. And when he realized that his, the jig was up, he left. The robot form of him left to try to avoid being discovered. Uh, and so as the uh, uh, credits start to roll, before the credits start to roll, um, I'll give each of you one last scene uh, to try to do before we wrap up. So, um, uh, Ryan, I think you said you had something you want to do with Max. No, no, it was just, I, I, I just said I didn't mean to Deus Ex Mac another scene. Oh. <laughs> Maxima. Yeah. Maxima, ah, I see what you said. Um, is there anything you want to do at the end of this episode? Uh, as the, obviously this bit with time wimey stuff, but as the as the credits roll, it's like, yeah. like someone else gets to make a, a, a deep, meaningful statement. Max is the last one out and just looks at the at the office and under his breath, set, like set, um, smile of satisfaction, a perfect impression of bugger this, I'm out. And that is Max's <laughs> last appearance on the show. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, um, Edwin. Um, you caught me off guard. Uh, <laughs> um, I can come back to you if you want. Yeah, come back to me. Okay, CJ. Okay, I think um, scene-wise, this probably comes before Max's because I think that would be an excellent end. Oh, yeah, no, that's, that's definitely yeah. the end of the episode. You're right. Uh, but it's sort of like when they're back. Um, after it's all been wrapped up and they're back at headquarters and she's sitting there with her coffee and, she's, and everyone else and she says how long do you think Agent Barnes was a robot? And just kind of like looks at everyone and is kind of um, you know I think there's a subsection in our rules about this I think if your supervisor is a robot for more than a month, you um, get your own team. You all did really well. And um, Max, I think you've earned a new catchphrase. What would Max do? <laughs> and that's, that's Nora's. Awesome. Uh... That one's cool. With it. I think it's a great way to kind of wrap things up. Uh, um, so yeah, so that is maybe the last episode ever of the team from Wonder. But uh, um, I hope you guys had a good time. Uh, that was uh, the game classified. Um, I loved uh, it. It's so much fun. Thank you guys. I love it was it. a blast. Thank you. Definitely a lot of me making stuff up, but uh, uh, it all hung together actually surprisingly well, especially when. Uh, 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 Everyone went off the projections, but I think that that ends up going really, really well. Uh, so um, if you're interested in Vacay for Classified, like I said, uh, it is still available uh, for pre-order on Backerkit. Please go for and uh, do a search for it and find it there. Um, if you love it, please back it. Thank you very much. Um, also, we do have sales for other that came from products going on uh, all throughout the weekend. Uh, there's some stuff for they came from on IPR, uh, and also there's a bundle of they came from stuff at Drive Through RPG. So if you're interested in physical books or a PDF print on demand, we have you covered for they came from goodness. Uh, so before we make our way out, um, how do people find you online? Let's start with Tom. Yeah, uh, you can probably find me on Discord now since I am going to avoid <laughs> Twitter for quite a while now. That seems fair. And I am on um, startplaying.games as Tom Murr, and I actually got uh, a few games scheduled there, like uh, the jump starter for They Came From Beyond the Grave, The Haunting mm -hmm. of Abbeham Priory. So if you like to get your dice wet in They Came From, this is your opportunity. Awesome. 
CJ? Hi everyone, I'm CJ. I'm CJ Starry on pretty much every social media. Uh, other than that, right now, I'm having a bit of a break. Usually my schedule is a bit more manic. Uh, you can find me Tuesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, on Scion, uh, The Coming Storm on the Onyx Path. And um, look forward to hopefully getting to do something like this with you all again. I had a great time. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Excellent. Edwin? Hi, uh, at Wessels. Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, with the handle or Discord, and it's just Pilgrim. Um, I'm going to make a little vouch for Tom. Please join him with uh, his games. Well worth it. Uh, I've been having a blast with it. And I would like to thank CJ for allowing me to kind of take her on the road trip. Uh, Ryan <laughs> for kind of semi bullying with uh, the character for a bit but i had a best thanks everybody. it was great thank you <laughs> <laughs> and ryan uh yeah i'm uh comrade bubbles on twitter and and, and discord um tumble and co-host as well uh a fair warning though because uh, it's related to they came from um they came from classified was part of a double um kickstarter with they came from the cyclops's cave Oh yes, uh, yes, and I am a contributing writer to on um, They Came from Witchford Academy, which is a supplement for Cyclops's Cave. So when that book is nearer to release, I will get very obnoxious about Cyclops's Cave and Witchford Academy. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, and you can find me online uh, at pugsteady.com. Uh, my my generally I'm pugsteady at dice.camp. I am still on Twitter for the near future. We'll see how that goes. Uh, if you like to hear uh, me talking about just kind of Onyx Path stuff and whatever else crosses my mind, usually, uh, I do, I'm do. i on most Fridays in the Onyx Pathcast. And in fact, we're doing a live episode of the Onyx Pathcast in about half an hour. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, go to the Onyx Path Twitch and uh, listen to us try desperately to stay on track for an hour. But we'll see how that goes. Me and my co-hosts, Dixie Cochran, Matthew Dawkins, and Daniel Malzum. Uh, but otherwise, you can find me generally on the Onyx Path Discord, uh, uh, including at They Came From Channels. Uh, we'd love to hear what you thought about the game and what you think about Classified. But other than that, uh, thank you all for coming. You guys have been a blast to play with. Um, you have made this weekend so much fun for me, so I really do appreciate it. Uh, thank you all in the chat for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>